We have a packed agenda this afternoon. First, the committee will hear remarks from each of the commissioners. Then I will provide a brief overview of my role as DFO, how the commission intends to engage with the committee and some important bylaws for committee members. After that, we will have the committee members introduce themselves, followed by the announcement of a chair and vice chair. We will then have a short 10 minute break before reconvening for a roundtable discussion of the committee on topics that are of interest to both the committee and the commission. I think at this point, I would like to turn it over to Chairman Maffei to begin the commissioner remarks. Okay, thank you very much. And it's uh, uh, good to uh, see uh, so many familiar faces, but also good to see a few new people that I have not uh, had a chance to meet. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here as it marks an important uh, milestone, um, but I, I, I really want to uh, give credit where credit is due, and that's to Commissioner Rebecca Dye, who has proposed gathering the shippers in this way uh, to provide input um, for the international uh, freight delivery system. Um, she's advocated this for many years, and it's in fact was part of her interim recommendations in fact finding 28 <laughs> way back in 2018. Uh, anyway, as time has passed, of course, the need for this group has only escalated, proving how prescient and wise a commissioner die is. So uh, I would I would ask uh, that the, the, the meeting organizers come back to me, uh, Dylan, if you could come back to me after Commissioner Benzel, but, but I want to get right to Commissioner Dye because this is really uh, due to a lot of uh, her work and thought. Uh, so let me yield to her first. Certainly, Commissioner Dye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Maffei. I've um, I have long advocated for a board of this type um, as to act as advisors to the FMC. Um, and I'm delighted that this meeting can be held today. Uh, thanks to our supporters and the House of Representatives and the Senate for propelling this board forward. Um, I know many of you um, from your participation on FMC innovation teams uh, and many of your, your companies as well. Yeah, and I, I very much appreciate that. Um, now that we're able to travel, uh, some people are uh, planning to come to the FMC soon for what I'm calling mini teams um, on a couple of very specific topics that we identified last year. I'll keep you involved and informed as we progress with those. I'm planning to recommend to the commission that we form also uh, an FMC ocean carrier and marine terminal and ports advisory board uh, and um, uh, perhaps a certain of your subcommittee, subcommittees may wish to meet with that board. Um, uh, when we get it stood up, I will say ambitiously. So thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, right now we need fresh, broader perspectives on the freight delivery system and other issues. I, I very much look forward to working with you. Thank you again. Good day. Thank you, Commissioner. I believe Commissioner Corey is not with us today, but I believe he has some remarks that were going to be delivered, entered into the record. Um, and so we will share those with the committee afterwards and include them in the minutes. Um, and I believe Commissioner Sola is traveling today and is not on the call. Assuming that's the case, Commissioner Bensel, are you there? Uh, hi, Dylan. I'm here. All right. Thank you. Please go ahead. 
Uh, just wanted to thank, uh, uh, I know many of you, uh, many of the shippers on the advisory uh, uh, committee, and, and I, I look forward to meeting the others as we go through this process. I think it's uh, uh, critically uh, important uh, to consider these issues at this point, at this juncture where our nation is uh, suffering uh, with, with uh, wrestling uh, with the problems that we have on, on ocean shipping. Um, uh, as you move forward, uh, your, your, your authorities under the committee are, are those of your own. And so your judgment on what you want to do and what you want to pursue is, uh, is, is that of yours. Uh, I will be uh, working and listening and uh, um, uh, uh, coordinating uh, with your advisory committee. I look forward to all of the uh, recommendations uh, that, you, that you make. I'm very supportive of of this effort, I think it's it's uh, it's something that we've long overdue, and uh, I'd echo uh, the comments of uh, the chairman uh, with respect to uh, Commissioner Dye's efforts to get this set up, and I also agree uh, with her uh, proposal to uh, to to establish a separate uh, advisory committee, uh, uh, and I think this is the template. I, I hope this is a the committee that can. Uh, they can show us the way and how we can do this and how we can use this productively uh, to come up with a better system of regulating ocean shipping. Um, I would urge, I, I was actually, there's a lot of interest uh, out there uh, publicly on, on this committee, um, the Shipper Advisory Committee. I uh, was on the phone with, with someone today uh, that, that's not on the advisory committee. So as you move forward, I'd, uh, I would uh, uh, recommend that you think of a way to incorporate broader views, the broader views of, of, of uh, uh, shipper communities out there. Um, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of willingness uh, to provide input. And so I think uh, uh, it, uh, it's uh, worthwhile to solicit as wide a, a, a selection of views and recommendations as possible. Um, but uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for your service. This is a very, uh, in, in my view, a very uh, honorable, uh, uh, assignment uh, and uh, and and uh, something that uh, I, I hope will be a uh, something that, as you look back in your career, something that you'll look uh, as a, as a mark of distinction. So, uh, with, with that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'll turn it back over to you. But uh, uh, good luck going forward, and, and I look forward to to working with you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Commissioner Benzel. And uh, thank you uh, to Commissioner Dye, um, who is uh, you, the usually modest and uh, not uh, claiming credit for this, but she worked so hard. And uh, and I, I too, like Commissioner Benzel, support uh, support her concept. Um, uh, I also want to say that uh, Commissioner Corey and uh, Commissioner Sola both have statements for the record, um, but uh, they also wanted me to just thank you on their behalf for your service. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't. We are five independent commissioners, all independently appointed for uh, periods of uh, a term that, that doesn't change with the change in, in the White House. Um, nonetheless, I, I know I can speak for all five of us, former Chairman Corey, Commissioner Sola, and of course, you've already heard from Commissioners uh, Dye and Benzel. So I speak for all five of us in saying that um, all five of us, uh, you have complete buy-in from us. And uh, that I think is important. You know, we all want to um, give you the autonomy you need, but also are all interested in, in your work and, and where that will lead. Um, I do wanna note that I am extremely grateful to the efforts of the FMC staff to get this committee up. I won't uh, you know, uh, single out particular people, but um, obviously the Office of the Secretary um, is, was absolutely key in this. Um, and uh, the, uh, some people from the Office of the Chairman as well. Um, although this uh, group's inception was envisioned and authorized uh, well before the current supply chain crisis, it is a tool that we certainly need um, as we look for ways to help the industry move forward in a productive way. Um, when the commission uh, met earlier this month, I shared some broad suggestion discussion topics with the committee, and I've also shared a detailed list with Mr. Richmond and with the FMC team supporting the committee, um, and uh, as have some of my colleagues as well. Um, my hope is that these are conversation starters. None of this should be seen as 
uh, you know, prescription of what you must do. But I do hope that these are conversation starters that will help the committee focus on some of the crucial challenges that are not only with us today, but have been historically very difficult to solve. Um, in particular, I'm asking you to look at what's necessary to increase cargo fluidity through technology and data sharing. Um, I'm, I'm looking for an honest discussion of fees. What's outrageous? What's tolerable? What may even be important to keep cargo flowing? what the commission can do, and some feedback on whether the commission's actions so far are making a difference, particularly in regard to uh, detention and demerge charges. Um, love some ideas on service contract, uh, the, that procedure and how that could be reformed in a way that could be beneficial. Looking for um, how the Federal Maritime Commission can address gaps in knowledge of shippers through seminars or other kind of outreach, or maybe something we haven't even thought of yet. And then finally, how actions of other federal agencies might be harming or might be able to help. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do and, and that I will say the administration, uh, the Biden administration has been very supportive of is reaching out uh, to other independent commissions like uh, the, uh, um, the, the Service Transportation Board, but also other piece of parts of the government like the Department of Transportation. And so it would be helpful if, if you did some thinking on that. I've said it many, many times before, I'll say it again now, increasing our understanding and the co-op and cooperation um, to get through the current disruption in the industry uh, is, is extraordinarily important. It's always tempting to demonize a particular sector and you know sometimes the ocean carriers or the terminal operators or, or, or anyone uh, will, will get that. But I think if we really wanna see positive change, we must all be prepared to come to the table, to work together and to work with others through the industry. And that is what I think uh, this committee uh, can be a great catalyst uh, for. So again, I wanna thank you for your service, uh, particularly uh, given how much you're paid. Uh, no, no one has paid anything for this, so you, you, you didn't miss a memo. Um, and I wanna thank you for your time. I truly believe this is an important endeavor. Back to you, Dylan. I feel like I'm back in broadcast news. Back to you, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and commissioners for your remarks. All right, so I would like to provide some brief remarks on the role of the designated federal officer or the DFO, how the commission intends to engage with the committee and some bylaws for the committee members. This is the, committee, the commission's sole federal advisory committee currently. So I thought it might be a good idea to sort of lay out some of these ground rules that apply to federal advisory committees. Like the commissioners, I wanna emphasize that the committee is ultimately responsible for its work and what ideas it pursues. The designated federal officer, also known as the DFO, is a role that is required under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. It operates as the primary liaison between the agency and the committee. This role is primarily administrative in nature, but it does include some important responsibilities as it relates to the committee's business. The DFO is responsible for calling meetings of the committee, and the DFO must be in attendance at each and every committee meeting, and it also will adjourn committee meetings. Along with calling the meetings, the DFO must approve the agenda before any full committee meeting. However, it's our intention for the chair and vice chair to be the ones primarily responsible for setting the agenda. I will be in touch with agency leadership as agendas are developed to gather any input they may have and keep them informed of the committee's activities. If the committee chooses to form subcommittees to conduct its work, those must be approved by the DFO and meetings intended by the DFO or an alternate DFO. There are also other duties for the DFO to ensure efficient operations of the committee, proper record keeping, and compliance with Federal Advisory Committee Act regulations. The commission will turn to the committee for advice and expertise, but the committee is not limited to only taking taskings from the commission. The chair and vice chair will play a very important role in guiding the committee's discussion and scope of work. At this point, I would like to go over a few important bylaws for committee members. These will be circulated to the committee shortly after the meeting. 
Membership of the committee balances many aspects and viewpoints of the international ocean freight delivery industry. Therefore, member attendance and participation at meetings is vital. Members are expected to adequately prepare for, attend, and meaningfully participate at meetings. Members may not use their access to the federal government as a member of this committee for the purpose of soliciting business or otherwise seeking economic advantage for themselves or their companies or employer. The committee as a whole may advise the commission on legislation or recommend legislative action, but in their capacity as committee members, individual members must not petition or lobby Congress for or against particular legislation or encourage others to do so. Members of the committee are advisors to the commission and have no authority to speak for the committee outside the committee structure. Members of the committee have no authority to speak for the commission or the US government. And members cannot testify before Congress in their capacity as a member of the committee. The commission will soon be adopting bylaws for the committee's use. And you guys will see this in writing shortly. I think at this point, that concludes what I would like to say. I want to start turning it over to the committee and have them introduce themselves. Um, we are actually somewhat ahead of schedule. Uh, so committee members, your introductions can be a little longer than I indicated. Um, but the first one I would like to call is, I'm going to go in alphabetical order by last name, is Michael Brock from Walmart. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dylan. So, so Michael Brock here. Um, I've been with Walmart for about 24 years in a variety of supply chain roles. Um, the first time on the global side uh, over a year ago. So, so my first experience with this global uh, side of the supply chain has been over the last year. So it's it's been a an exciting one to say the least. Um, but uh, you know, I've, I've spent time on the inventory side. I've spent side time on the transportation domestic side. I've spent uh, time on the distribution side uh, throughout my 24 years. And then obviously the last last year from origin um, all the way through destination. Um, and I've got responsibility uh, to deliver to our regional DCs that um, are within 100 miles of our stores for the most part. But uh, Really excited to be on the uh, advisory board and, and support uh, this initiative to, to help us move forward. Thank you, Michael. Next up is Brian Bumpus of Brentag North America. Hi, everybody. Thank you for, for having us today um, and for inviting us to, to, to be on this committee. Um, as Dylan just indicated, my name is Brian Bumpus. I'm the Director of Logistics and Transportation for Brentag North America. Uh, which is the North American subsidiary of Brentag uh, AG, one of the largest chemical distributors uh, globally. Um, been with Brentag since 2012, and my responsibilities include the management of all international trade, import and export, as well as trade compliance. Um, and in addition to that, the uh, domestic uh, spend that we have, uh, not including our private fleet. So that would cover bulk tanker trucks, full truck load, less than truck load, any sort of flatbeds and project cargo that we have moving as well. Um, before that, I uh, was a, an export sales representative with Evergreen uh, Line and uh, actually uh, served Gabriel's account for a while uh, down in Miami. So it's good to see a familiar face in this group. Um, anyway, um, thank you so much again. And I look forward to working with these guys in, in hopes of you know, moving forward into a positive direction. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next, we have Justin Colley with CHS. Thanks, Dylan. Um, so I'm Justin Colley. I'm the Director of Transportation at CHS Inc. CHS Inc. is the nation's largest farmer-owned cooperative. Um, I graduated in ag business from University of Illinois, and I started my career selling commodities internationally in containers. Uh, I came to CHS about eight years ago to build a container export program. Um, I have since now moved to oversee all transportation at CHS. That includes ocean vessels, barges, rail. Um, in addition to this, I serve on the Surface Transportation Board National Car Council. Um, I currently live in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'll be graduating with my MBA from the University of Minnesota at the end of this year. Thanks, Justin. Next is Bob Connor with Mallory Alexander. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, 
I will come in under a minute. Uh, I started my career in the ocean transportation industry in 1978 with the United States Lines. At that time, Malcolm McLean was the owner of, uh, of US Lines. And for all of you uh, who may not recognize that name, he is the individual credited with uh, really being the founder of container shipping. In my 40 year career in the industry, I spent half of it on the carrier side and the second half of it on the forwarding and international logistics side. While a carrier, I had the opportunity to work with some real industry pioneers, such as like Don Aldridge, Jacques Sade of CMA, Karahan Saga of APAC and, and Centerline. Uh, and during my career, uh, I had the opportunity to be the president of Senator Line for a few years. And also I was the president of Hamilton Terminal Company, which is a subsidiary of Hapag Lloyd, responsible for uh, providing m and uh, services to the chassis and container industry, as well as to offering a significant uh, container grayage operation. Uh, during my 20 year, career on the carrier side, I would advise that uh, unfortunately during those years, most of the carriers generally lost money. Uh, in 1999, I left the carrier side to go to what as my carrier colleagues referred to, to go to the dark side and, and work for, for in the forwarding industry in the area of ocean transportation procurement. Uh, currently, I'm most fortunate to be part of Mallory Alexander International Logistics, we're a 100 year old company owned by the Mallory family. And we are arguably the largest international forwarder and warehousing distribution company in the ag export market. Uh, combined with the thousands of containers that the Mallory moves under its MBO banner, Mallory Transportation Systems, the company is ranked as one of the top 53 PLs in the world. Uh, during my entire career, 40 years, I have never seen conditions that we experience today and is, is my sincere hope that our community will have the positive influence to develop constructive, but not overreactive change to ship, shipping regulations as contained uh, under, under the OSTRA 21 initiative. Uh, finally, I'd like to make a few quick thank yous. I'd like to thank the Mallory family for their commitment to the industry and to give me the time to participate in the NSAC group. I'd like to thank the Board of Governors of the New York, New Jersey Forwarders and Brokers Association, uh, colleagues of mine for their nomination, uh, me to participate in the committee. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Maffei and the other FMC commissioners for including me as part of NSAC. And finally, I would like to extend a special thanks to uh, former Chairman Mike Corey and Commissioner Rebecca Dye for the opportunity to have worked with them in the past on other projects. Bob. Next up is Chris Crutchfield with American Commodity Company. Hello, everyone, and uh, excited to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Chris Crutchfield with ACC Rice uh, in uh, Williams, California, in Northern California. Uh, we're a soup to nuts uh, rice uh, company. Um, uh, my partners and I produce rice, and uh, we have drying and storage facilities as well as milling. Uh, packaging, marketing, shipping uh, side of things. Um, I, uh, uh, along with being CEO of the company, I handle all of the marketing and sales and shipping and logistics side, side of things. Uh, we do a little over 100,000 uh, tons of rice uh, in the export market um, every year. Uh, most of that goes through the Port of Oakland and containers. Some of it goes through Sacramento and Stockton and Breakbolt. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, seriously, uh, <laughs> struggling with, uh, times these days and, uh, look forward to working with all of you, uh, and coming up with some solutions and, uh, trying, uh, uh to figure out, uh, uh, some ways to, to make, uh, agricultural commodities, um, uh, move, uh, out of, out of the United States in a more effective and efficient way. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next is Rick DeMeo with Office Depot. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, including me uh, in this in this important effort. Um, I'm I'm thrilled to be on this team and and meet and work with uh, 
many of the people that uh, are on the call today. I, uh, the Senior Vice President of Supply Chain for Office Depot, uh, I've been there about 10 years. I've got responsibility for all the strategy and execution uh, in supply chain. Uh, prior to that, spent 23 years doing the exact same thing for Sears and Kmart at Sears Logistics Services, where I ran that organization and its uh, third party arm as well. Um, I've had sea freight experience, international shipping experience in, in both companies. And um, I, I too uh, echo some of the sentiment that I heard earlier, some of the introductions about uh, never having a bigger challenge in this space than we see right now. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this and thank everybody for their uh, opportunity. Thanks, Rick. Next up is Scott Fremont with Target. Thank you, Dylan, and uh, thank you to the chairman and commissioners for establishing the group of shippers here to help um, support such a vital part of our country's economy. Uh, Scott Fremont, I'm the vice president of transportation uh, for Target. This includes uh, our international logistics, global trade services, uh, domestic inbound transportation, and then all of our domestic outbound transportation to our stores. I've uh, been at Target for 15 years, uh, various roles, including e-commerce, uh, merchandise, and inventory management. Uh, I'm excited to represent um, Target and uh, looking forward to working with this committee and helping to co-create some solutions uh, to help drive changes um, across our supply chain. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sean Healy with Schooler. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Healy. I'm the director of Ocean Freight for the Schooler Company. Uh, Schooler is a 130-year-old agri-commodities trading company. We're, we're headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm based in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, we, we ship about 140,000 TUs annually uh, globally. Uh, the majority of that volume is uh, export volume from the United States, uh, primarily to Asia. And, um, you know, it's, it's animal feed, it's grain, um, it's, it's some food items as well. Uh, previously served on Commissioner Dye's export supply chain innovation team, uh, as well as fact finding number 29. Um, I also serve on the AgTC advisory board, as well as the New York Shipping Exchange member council. And um, I just look forward to working with all of you and happy to be here. Thanks, Sean. Next, we have Steve Hughes, who represents NEMA and the Auto Care Association. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing me to join this commission uh, or this uh, advisory committee. It's work couldn't be, uh, or it's it's uh, uh, starting of this committee couldn't come at a more important time in the supply chain uh, disruption, I think is a, a kind word to describe what we're going through right now. Um, my background is I've been in the automotive parts industry my whole career. Um, I started back in the early 70s uh, uh, at a parts store and uh, uh, ended up getting recruited to uh, uh, become purchasing uh, and supply chain uh, management at one of the largest importers in the United States in the automotive aftermarket. Um, throughout my career, I've been involved in the, in the uh, international logistics purchasing. So uh, I have experience on, uh, significant experience on the purchasing side. But then in about 2014, uh, when we started having labor issues or, or discussions that is on the West Coast, and we had some issues similar to what we're seeing today, although not quite as bad, um, our industry reached out to me to, uh, supply them with information of what was going on because our industry just had a blind side, if you will, to uh, ocean freight and uh, the various issues that uh, we were seeing. Since then, I've been an advisor to both our major trade associations, the Auto Care Association and the Motor Equipment Manufacturers Association. Um, and uh, um, I'm very honored to have them nominate me to uh, uh, represent them on this committee. So one of the things that I would uh, that I would hope we accomplish here is making sure we break out of our individual silos 
and look at the overall scheme of things and uh, work towards the greater good and, and uh, try not to be uh, too self-centered, if you will. Uh, uh, given the, uh, the makeup of this committee, I don't think that's gonna be a problem. But uh, again, thank you very much to the FMC and the commissioners and the chairman for inviting me to participate in this committee. Thanks, Steve. Next, we have Alexis Jacobson representing Bosco Trading. Hi, everyone, and um, thank you for the FMC and the commissioners uh, for inviting me to be a part of this um, committee. My name is Alexis Jacobson. I am the International Accounts Manager at Bosco Trading. We are a uh, smaller forage exporter, so we may mostly export grass straw, um, a little bit of hay sometimes to um, Asia, located in Tangent, Oregon, which is about an hour and a half south of Portland, because most people are not going to know where Tangent, Oregon is. Um, I started with the company five years ago, and um, we have seen the challenges just rise and rise, and um, I'm very thankful that AgTC and the U.S. Forage Export Council pushed me to um, to run for this committee or be on the committee, and uh, look forward to working with the import and export side uh, to work through some solutions that we all could use. So, thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Next is Fernando Lagenel with DuPont. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Fernando Lagonel. I'm the global category leader for DuPont. I've been in the industry about 25 years, uh, the last seven years with DuPont, and I have responsibilities for all the procurement strategy uh, for global ocean, air, freight forwarding, and custom house brokerage. Uh, I'm located in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, in our uh, global headquarters, which is about five miles from uh, President Biden's home here in Delaware. So it's my honor to serve in this um, commission and uh, committee. And, and again, good luck to everyone. Uh, I think we're all feeling the pain of what's happening today, and we're all eager to put solutions forward uh, to change the environment that we're in. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Allison Levitt from the Wine and Spirit Shippers Association. Hi everyone and uh, echo the sentiments. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to serve on this committee. Really look forward to working with everybody. Um, I know uh, quite a few of you or at least met quite a few of you. Um, as mentioned, I'm Allison Levitt. I have been the managing director of the Wine and Spirits Shipping Association for the last eight years. I definitely have the best commodity of all the groups. So um, when, we, when we go live, hopefully I'll bring you all samples. But um, we have about 700 members um, representing primarily import, but also export from the USA, as well as cross trade and members as small as the kind of companies that just bring in a few pallets of the, you know, the most expensive French Bordeaux to the companies that uh, have thousands of containers of the grocery store type wine that you see in Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, et cetera. So I've been in the business, um, logistic business for forever. My ancestors were sea captains. My family had a shipping agency. I grew up boarding vessels. And uh, so as they say, it, it is in the blood. Um, it's always been a part of my life. And um, like everyone else, never, never quite seen it as bad as this. We at WSSA manage 24 contracts right now um, with virtually every single steamship line, some of them global, some of them regional. So we, um, I usually spend much more of my time overseas working directly with the carriers. So certainly service contracts are something uh, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to talking about um, as well as all the other points that uh, the chairman has outlined for us. Um, so I live up in Portland, Maine, a beautiful place to, to live and uh, in my spare time, I like to go out on, uh, you know, 20 mile runs and uh, uh, swim in the ocean and ski in the mountains. So um, I live in a great place for that. And again, look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. My runs are not quite 20 miles, but that's awesome. All right. Next is Dan Miller with Cargill. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, Dan Miller. I am the global lead for international transportation activities for Cargill. In this role, I support uh, global container uh, sourcing activities, air, LCL, drayage. Um, globally, we ship about 350,000 TEU uh, from North America. We're exporting with all the conglomerates uh, together. It's about 90,000 TEU exported. Um, Cargill, we were a large food ag uh, company. It's about 156 years old. We, we produce anything from uh, food ingredients. We export beef, poultry, cotton, uh, some bioindustrial products that uh, be used in asphalt or biodegradable, biodegradable uh, plastics. Um, prior to working at Cargill, uh, I spent a little time in, with uh, Archer Daniels Midland Company. Uh, again, in a very similar role, uh, primarily in the uh, international side of things. The uh, introduction to me getting into the international space was in uh, 2002, in, uh, right as the uh, port strike was happening. So that was my introduction to this industry and, you know, kind of learning in, uh, in a similar environment to where we're at right now. And I, I, sentiments with everybody here. You know, I think we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. We all see the obstacles. Uh, I think we've got a lot of great experience that we can all bounce a lot of great ideas off of one another and, you know, here to listen, collaborate, and uh, truly appreciate the opportunity to support the team and everybody here. Thank you, Dan. Next on the list is Deb Minsky with IKEA. Good day, everyone. Um, I'm going to echo what we've heard uh, quite a bit is a, a much appreciation and a thank you uh, for being asked to be on this committee. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I've been with IKEA for 16 years. Um, of that 16 years, about 12 in ocean transportation. Uh, I started out in our distribution center in, uh, in Maryland. Um, started working in transportation actually when I was there working more on the land side um, and, and our exports to our stores. Went actually back to school for transportation and logistics management, fell in love with the ocean, and uh, opportunity came about with an IKEA, uh, which I applied for and, and was able to get. Uh, since then, my main focus has been on the operations side as a receiving unit, um, but we are set up as being in charge of all the Americas. So we do also work directly with our exports out of South America and, and some from the US as well to uh, Dominican. Um, I've spent a lot of time with pretty much every port terminal in the US uh, and some Canada, uh, learning their operations, working directly with ocean carriers on how we can improve things and, Obviously, we, we still have many gaps and, and it's an, a new era for our industry and we need to catch up with some things. So I look forward to being one of the, the pioneers and leaders uh, with this group to do just that. Thank you again. Great, thank you, Deb. Next is Jen Morrissey with Ocean Spray Cranberries. Thank you and good afternoon. I um, really appreciate the opportunity to serve here in this distinguished panel. Um, great experience across the board. I have been in the industry managing ocean transportation for 17 years, um, split evenly between Ocean Spray and TJX. I'm currently in the capacity of head of international transportation and global customer operations for Ocean Spray Cranberries. Um, I do possess a US customs broker's license and previously was in a similar capacity with TJX. So I understand both perspectives and I really look forward to hearing from um, my peers on the team and the commissioners and chairman of the FMC. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. Next we have Ken O'Brien with Gemini Shippers Group. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ken O'Brien. Um, today I serve as president of Gemini Shippers Group. Uh, Gemini is a shippers association um, based in New York City. Um, uh, the company actually has, and the group has a, a history going back about 100 years, um, primarily driven by the fashion and apparel industry, um, and became a shippers association um, in 1985, right after the Shipping Act change. 
Um, today we have around 300 members spread um, over all different commodities. So we're not, we're not vertical or commodity specific. Um, prior to joining uh, Gemini, I spent over 20 years on the carrier side. And so I worked for two different ocean carriers, um, primarily all in uh, pricing and trade roles. And so I've had, you know, different opportunities to interact with the commission um, as a carrier. And, and certainly also I was part of the supply chain innovation team and the fact finding 29 team. And I think the important part, you know, as, I, as we go into this and the part I'm thinking about is, um, you know, the chairman talked about, you know, the, there's a, there's a tendency to, to, to put blame and try and assess blame when, when there's things like this and disruption like this happens. And I think the only way to prevent that is really to have an, an honest and open discussion about what a identifying problems and, and B then getting at what is tactically possible to fix it in the short term. And then strategically what's, what's ultimately wrong um, with the system that, that, you know, different actors can, can potentially change to, to make the entire system better. And so I'm excited to uh, excited to work with everyone in the group and, and hopefully come up with some some good suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Next, we have Adnan Kudri with Amazon. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the commissioners and the FMC for pulling, uh, giving me the opportunity to be on this commission. I'm looking forward to all the work that we can do to kind of help improve the overall su supply chain and some of the challenges that everyone's facing right now. Um, I've been with Amazon slightly, I've been with Amazon close to eight years now. Uh, my current role is focused on multi-year planning and network design and strategy for the imports business. Uh, previously, I was managing all of the operations for North America and Europe uh, on the import side of things. Uh, before that, I've spent about eight years working for APL and APL Logistics, so on the liner side of things, uh, primarily most of the time spent in the U.S., along with a stint uh, based out of Singapore, uh, running some of the operations in Asia. Um, looking forward to working with everyone and uh, hope, hoping we can kind of uh, solve some of the challenges that are ahead of us. Thank you, Atnan. Next is Rich Froch with Mohawk Global Logistics. Thanks, Dylan. Yes, uh, Rich Roach. I'm vice president at Mohawk Global Logistics. Uh, we're a uh, company about uh, nine offices, 260 employees in the uh, mostly the Northeast, as far west as Chicago and south as Atlanta. Uh, NVO, um, uh, customs broker, and uh, consulting, uh, domestic trucking. So we offer a, a lot of different products. I started my career about 40 years ago uh, as a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. I went to sea for six years on cargo ships and uh, sailed as a pilot in New York as well. Um, I then uh, actually reported up to Bob Connor at, at the Ocean Carrier for uh, about five years before I went over to the dark side. Um, I started up my career uh, about 28 years ago with uh, DSL. Um, I then started my own company, which was a customs broker and, uh, and NVOCC. Uh, that I sold to Mohawk Global Logistics about 12 years ago. Um, I'm also representing here and, and very uh, humbled to have the uh, nomination of NCBFAA. Um, NCBFAA is an organization of customs brokers and freight forwarders, uh, more than 1,100 companies strong. So, and we, we do have uh, a, a big range in terms of size of NVOs and customs brokers there, um, but I do hope to represent the, the voice of the small company. Uh, as part of NVO, uh, NCBFAA. Um, I did serve on three of the uh, innovation teams, including Fact Finding 29, um, 28, and uh, worked uh, also with the Memphis team. Um, and uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to uh, potentially coming up with solutions. I know there's no silver bullets in this, and it's going to require a lot of dialogue, but uh, very humbled to be here and part of this very impressive group, and I look forward to getting to work. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Next is Gabriel Rodriguez with a Customs Brokerage Inc. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when uh, Rich was mentioning the uh, voice of the small business, he was talking about me. Uh, I am uh, Gabe Rodriguez. I'm president of A Customs Brokerage. Uh, very honored to be on this panel, uh, this committee. Uh, very thankful to the commission and to all those involved for, for creating this. Uh, we are in some uh, interesting times and uh, looking forward to 
bringing some positive change and some positive solutions to the table. Um, I also am a board member of the NCDFAA uh, along with Rich and also president of the Florida Custom Brokers Association. I've been a customs broker for 22 years and I'm also a licensed NVOCC. So I've had experience uh, for about the last 18 years in ocean transportation as well. Um, looking forward to this and uh, thank you again. Thanks, Gabriel. Next, Randy Strait with Tyson. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as he said, my name is Randy Strait. I am uh, work for Tyson Foods. I've been with Tyson for about 40 years, uh, that entire time in transportation. And uh, the last 30 of that has been an international. I currently serve as the uh, Senior Director of Global Logistics. So basically, my teams are responsible for everything that Tyson does, except for domestic reefer trucking. We do all the bulk uh, domestic moves in both truck and rail. I uh, have a fleet of about 2,000 rail cars. And then also, obviously, the, the big part of it is the uh, exporting uh, to all the foreign countries to our delivering to our customers. Um, we, we are responsible for exporting beef, pork, and poultry, and some of the uh, affiliated um, materials along with that, like cattle hides and poultry meal. Um, it's as everyone has said, obviously, this is a great uh, opportunity. Uh, I thank the both the commission and my my uh, uh, my partners for uh, nominating me to be part of this commission. I, I think it's a great opportunity to, uh, you know, talk together and figure out, you know, what is the right solution. I hope that we can drive change and bring um, smart and intelligent and effective solutions for everybody. And I really look forward to uh, to working together. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Next is Mike Simonanis with Louis Dreyfus. Hello, uh, Mike Simonanis. I lead the export logistics and supply chain team for the cotton business uh, within Louis Dreyfus Company based in Memphis, Tennessee. We are a top US container exporter on an annualized basis per the Journal of Commerce reporting. Um, this year, or actually this week, marks my 30th first year working in the ocean container shipping industry. And so first at the carrier side, similar to Ken and Adnan at APL, another alumni, and then now for as a shipper for the last 18 seasons, which I've uh, calculated out to be 126 regular years of work uh, in cotton. I'm proud to work with the members of the US cotton export community, both in American Cotton Shippers Association and the Texas Cotton Association and bring their voices to the committee. And that, similar to some of the people have said, it's the small single person shop all the way to the global multinational. Our members are West Coast, East Coast, and Gulf Port and Intermodal exporters. And we moved 189,000 FEU in the 21, 20, or 2021 crop marketing year that just ended at the end of July. So uh, Southern half of the US focus from Oakland to Norfolk on a daily, weekly basis. As we begin our work, I will close with today's guidance from the Maxwell Daily reader on leadership. Allow your problems to motivate you toward greater creativity and strength. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Now we have Josh Woods from Blue Diamond Growers. Thanks, thanks Dylan. Um, first of all, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm traveling right now. So, um, but I do want to thank the, uh, the commission and then also all of my peers on, on the committee. You know, I, I represent Blue Diamond Growers where I'm the director of international and domestic transportation and warehousing. Uh, we're a, a family owned or a grower owned co-op uh, over a century year old and, you know, shipped to 65 plus countries across the globe. And, this opportunity, I, I, I can't express enough how badly it's needed across the, the country and in helping the movements in and out of our port. And I'm, and I'm excited to be able to share our perspectives, um, not only of the, of the almond community, but also of Ag TC. Um, and then also I sit on the board of the Northern California World Trade Center. And, you know, bringing all of those perspectives, as my peer said before, I think it's critical to the success of not only this commission, but also, or this committee, but also to just logistics in general in the United States. So thanks again. Thank you, Josh. And thank you for being flexible with uh, your arrangements and logging on today. 
The last committee member is Colin Yankee from Tractor Supply. Hey Dylan, thanks. Uh, I get to be the caboose in the introductions here with uh, the alph alphabetical disadvantage, uh, but I'll close out the introductions. Um, as Dylan said, my name is Colin Yankee. I'm the Chief Supply Chain Officer for Tractor Supply Company. We're a rural lifestyle retailer. We have almost uh, 2,000 stores in 49 states, and I'm based in the Nashville, Tennessee area. I've been with Tractor Supply since 2015, and I'm responsible for our end-to-end -end supply chain. So that includes merchandise planning, inventory management, international and domestic uh, transportation logistics, and uh, distribution center operations. And as the rest of the committee has said, uh, it's great to be part of this group of importers and exporters and to be able to work with uh, just a, an expert group of operators and leaders. And just hearing everybody's introductions, really humbling, um, great variety of experiences. And I think as Steve alluded to in his intro, I think that'll lead to a really balanced um, perspective instead of recommendations. And I look forward to contributing to the conversation on behalf of my company, Track Supply, um, but also America's retailers uh, to find solutions and recommendations for the committee. Thank you, Colin. And that is the committee. Uh, I want to thank everyone. Well, all of them. glad the committee was able to join and we did have all members in attendance. Um, next on our agenda is the chair and vice chair. This will be more of an announcement. But in the committee's charter, it says that the members will elect a chair and vice chair. We solicited nominations for these positions and the committee voted. Um, so I would like to announce that the chair will be Brian Bumpus from Brintag and the vice chair will be Mike Simoneus of Louis Dreyfus. Uh, you all want to say anything or that's okay if not. Or... Yeah, sorry, I have, okay. didn't know I was on mute there, but. Um, I just want to, again, thank the FMC for the support and the creation of this committee and, um, and especially to Commissioner Dye for her vision uh, for this. Um, you know, as most of the members said, timing couldn't be better. Uh, and I'm confident that you guys have put together a diverse group of experts that uh, will certainly bring forth productive and viable recommendations for change. Um, it's certainly an honor for all of us to serve on the committee. Um, and I know that we all appreciate the FMC support, um, both uh, in our work in supply chain management uh, but also for our respective industries. Um, and then certainly to the uh, my fellow committee members, thanks so much for your faith in me. I'm um, looking forward to working with you in our collective effort to um, resolve the issues and inefficiencies that we're all experiencing. And while the current freight markets are certainly some of the worst that we've seen, uh, many of the problems that are so evident now have in fact been present uh, for years and years past. So it's my hope that we can work toward a vision uh, of a preferred future that is jointly shared by shippers, carriers, ports, uh, and of course, um, the FMC. So thank you. I'll thank just Brian. jump in and say that, yeah, I, I support, you know, all the work that we're going to do and look forward to working with everybody. I mean, clearly there's a great cross-section and diverse perspective and experience that we're going to bring to the task. As all of you know, what we're facing did not develop as a result of the recovery from COVID. So the way forward is together and the way forward is through our efforts to figure out what um, we could realize. And I look forward to supporting the work of Brian and the rest of you and all the voices that we're bringing into our deliberations on a consistent basis. Thanks guys. So I will in the future work most closely with Brian and Mike, but we'll be available to the entire committee and you, the committee will be involved in sort of planning um, and the committee's work. Um, at this point, we would like to take a short break. Uh, we will return in 10 minutes um, for a roundtable discussion by the committee. Thank you. On my computer. I have 212 on my computer, so I will go ahead and sort of begin the next part of today's meeting. Uh, we are going to begin the portion of today's program that I believe everyone has signed on for and is particularly interested in hearing. The agency has some ideas on topics that we hope to get the thoughts and expertise of the committee members from. 
they are broadly these three things information sharing and transparency among supply chain actors cargo fees and current observations of the supply chain the committee is not limited to discussing those topics and we welcome the committee introducing other ideas during this session um, at this point i will sort of just turn over to the committee probably might work best if committee members have some would could raise their hands and i will keep track and call um, as i see it it should pop up on my screen um, i think we want to start off with the information sharing and transparency point um, so, yeah Don't everybody speak at once. Uh, and to raise your hand, there's a button at the bottom with reactions. Just click that and then click raise hand. Um, so Dylan can see you guys. I see Mike has his hand raised. It should pop up on my screen too. I guess to kind of start us off, I think there were two things that as we looked at it with for cotton as and in the export community, that one was to really try to understand as we as Chairman Buffet has kind of communicated, you know, his vision, goals, and objectives on the national uh, port of operations metrics and visibility standards. And I would say more in, inside of that, that respect proprietary information. Clearly, Port of LA and Commissioner Dye have worked on this for quite a while. It hasn't expanded beyond that operating area for some, for reasons that are not necessarily clear today. And so I think you know, some of it is the the interconnectivity of systems and things like that. So we've got, you know, so looking at this as it relates to our second one, which is really looking at aligned and stable ERD documentation and port cutoff change visibility and management guidance at the alliance port vessel service level. The export side, as you are also experiencing the import side, the congestion, the delays, the disruption has a consequential impact for exporters. E early return dates, port cutoffs, documentation cutoffs are changing daily, multiple times in the same day, and really destroying the ability to meet export pickup commitments. And so we cannot fundamentally change the physical aspect of what's going on at this point. And, and yet the ability to see better the implications of what's going on, I believe, sits inside of something our members are trying to get inside of, right? To look at, at, you know, and it's too macro to say nationally. So how do you look at it at the Alliance service port level, right? A particular string, trying to get some better visibility on if three vessels are six days apart when they're normally 21 days apart, how soon does somebody see that? And how, and where does it go from, you know, green to yellow to red as an example? So those would be two I would just kind of put up more broadly that we've already submitted but I want to just get in front of the, the broader uh, committee members for consideration. I think I see Brian's hand up. And you're muted. Might help, I'll get used to that. Um, to echo what Michael was saying about the lack of interconnectivity within systems uh, or between systems, you know, certainly there are blockchain solutions coming uh, to our industry. Um, you know, it could be short term, could be long term. I don't really know. Um, I don't think any of us have a technology roadmap there or a timeline for when to expect that. Uh, but the absence of blockchain requires the use of traditional communication methods to share data and updates, including orders, uh, booking requests, booking confirmations, SDS sheets in my industry or IMOs, uh, arrival notices and freight invoices. Uh, and email is used almost exclusively for this, while uh, TMS platforms that some shippers may have uh, in-house or certainly forward or provided tracking platforms do allow for quote unquote real time visibility of track and trace data. But this track and trace data, especially now, uh, is often not up to date due to delays or inaccuracies originating in carrier systems, which kind of feeds all of those downstream. Um, so, you know, certainly uh, this creates a little bit of a hodgepodge of, of visibility issues. Um, it's almost like driving your car with certain parts of your windshield covered up with mud and uh, still being expected to get uh, through obstacles without collision. Um, additionally, there's really no real-time visibility that I'm aware of to shippers of vessel load factors uh, or uh, true real-time visibility of equipment supply and, and deficit areas, um, which would allow you know, shippers to better proactively plan 
uh, to avoid you know, their transshipment ports that have congestion, uh, you know, carriers that are already overbooked for certain service strings, uh, or carrier port of origination combinations that have a, no, no equipment there. Um, you know, giving shippers this visibility certainly helps our business, but it would also help uh, the carriers, I think, uh, better facilitate uh, certainly the equipment deficit areas um, and balance your demand a little bit uh, more efficiently, if that makes sense. Dan, I see your hand. Dan, are you there? Dan. Scott. Sure, I can go if uh, Dan's working out the technology issues. Um, it, I think it's important, you know, as we continue to see all the headlines and articles about the problems facing the industry right now, it, it's a struggle when um, there's just a one data point or one sided data that is being provided when you don't have that full end-to-end -end visibility um, of what the BCO's data is, what the terminal's data is, what the port data is, what the carrier data is, to really assess from a problem-solving standpoint, are the things that we're even trying right now gonna make a difference? Will 24 seven operations actually drive a change or is that not the root cause of what's going on? And I think it's difficult when we don't have openness to that data for everyone to kind of dig in and problem solve and being able to um, assess, you know, objectively what is going on and get to that true root cause. So, you know, I think this is absolutely fundamental if we want to start to assess problem solving in this and not just try things and see if they work, but actually have the data uh, behind it and the analytics to say, is this going to make a difference? And is this actually going to help solve the root cause? All right. Thank you, Scott. Dan Miller, are you there? I saw your hand yeah, up you earlier. Now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry about that. No, I think because we look at all the different uh, intermodal uh, opportunities that we have, whether it be on the drainage side or the, uh, the rail side, uh, too many times we see ocean carriers have one date and we're, we're working with them to return something. The, the, uh, the rail is already a day ahead of their updating the, as far as the cutoff dates. So trying to get everything connected in a single system, you know, I, I don't know how what the solution is, but you've got so many different TMS systems. Uh, the ports have one date, the rail has another date, the carriers have another date. Um, there has to be at least some sort of uh, alignment, like you know, we said earlier. You know, if, what turns, what makes the thing turn yellow? You know, at least give some pre-notice that hey, there might be an issue here. That has at least a step in the right direction, but to get all these links in the supply chain aligned is I think the first piece, you know, just whether it be technology can do that or not, I don't know yet, but, uh, you know, there has to be something we can look at to, to move this forward. Thank you. Steve Hughes, you're next on the list. Thank you. Um, so it doesn't, to, in, in my point of view, it doesn't matter how good uh, of a communication we have from the carriers if it goes way back to how it was, uh, a ship was loaded to uh, uh, you know, the, the transit time to whether there's an anchor or not, or, or how good the labor or the terminal's working. If the front gate isn't efficient, everything else is moot. Um, I was uh, uh, part of the supply chain innovations team with Rich and Deb and Ken a uh, number of years ago. And for those of you that aren't aware, um, we were split into three teams. And those three teams were given the task, and there's about 32, 36 of us, I think, that we were split up into these teams. And the order of the day was come back with the one most important thing that would help with uh, uh, 
helping the supply chain and the ports. And all three teams came back with the same thing. We've got to clean up and make the front of the, the gate basically more efficient. Um, right now, specifically in LA Long Beach, which uh, this dominoes into everybody because of the problems we have here, um, we have the issues with uh, triangle moves, uh, ref refusal of empties, uh, uh, lack of chassis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is such a challenge for the dredge community to get in and out uh, that, as I said, it doesn't matter what's going on behind the gate. If you can't get those trucks in and out and get that cargo moving as quickly as possible, everything else is kind of moot at this point. And I think we uh, to, to look at what do we do now, uh, to me, that's the most important thing to, to discuss. Long-term, everything that you're talking about is absolutely critical. But for the short term, uh, I th what we really need to do is focus on what's going on in that gate. And one of the concerns I have is this new fee that was uh, announced at the uh, LA Long Beach by the, uh, by the ports. Uh, I'm concerned that this is actually gonna cause even more problems uh, than uh, it's going to fix. I understand the logic behind it uh, and it makes some sense, but unfortunately, because we don't have that throughput at the front gate, I think this could cause us more troubles than, than, uh, than we have already. Uh, until we fix the chassis problem, until we get some sort of a, of a fix for the empties issues and start getting that real flow of those trucks through the terminals instead of a four hour wait for these guys, never mind what the, the churn time is from the geo post, but the true wait time until we cut that down to an hour for these trucks, we're not gonna get those, those uh, boxes out of there. Um, and I have one important question for the, the commission and that is, uh, was the FMC given notice about this fee and if so, did it go through the proper process under the California Association of Port Authorities Agreement that's on file with the FMC since the 40s? Uh, so we, we need to look at this new, this new fee if it was implemented uh, under that authority. Um, and we have to consider what the impacts are going to be. But we've got to get that fluidity at the front gate. Thank you. Deb, you're next. Deb Minsky, you're next. Well, first I'm going to start with, um, yeah, what Steve said was what <laughs> it was my start um, <laughs> on both points, actually. Um, but but more so, it's it's also in accord in accordance with what he's saying. It, it, it's having a plan and sticking to the plan. And and I get there's going to be some some variance some variance is not a problem but you know if if your your truck is on the way to take an empty back and they say oh we changed our mind and we're not doing empties anymore today that's a huge problem and yeah. and that needs to be addressed quickly because these are the little bottlenecks that have created the huge huge bottleneck we have today and we we got to fix some of the, the basic things i i think um and again, one opinion, and I'm certainly open to other ones. Uh, I think the technology goes hand in hand with this, but along with the technology, there's got to be a plan and we got to stick to the plan. There's appointment systems to pick up containers. It needs to be adhered to on both sides. The, the empty returns, it's, it's got to be advance notice of this is the plan. And then we stick to it. So if 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 we can't start organizing ourselves in better ways, and when I say us, I mean the entire supply chain industry. It's not just BCOs. It's not just ports, carriers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, truckers. It's all of us. Um, and maybe that that's a good starting point. Is we we should start identifying some, some things 
that might be good to work on. Uh, again, I'm not sure, but this is the start and we need to address a lot of things here. Michael Brock, you are next. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Deb, Steve, and Scott. It, uh, that gate and being able to execute what you want, what you're planning to execute and efficiently use the rest resources that you are planning to dedicate to that gate is, is vital, whether it be the plan, the systems, long-term, et cetera. It's, I think all of us in a lot of cases want to get our loaded containers from the port, specifically SoCal is what, what I'm talking to. And it's just the barriers and the adjustments to our original plan, especially this empty return piece. Um, it's huge, huge to making it happen. So I, I'm just reiterating what those three said for sure. Bob uh, Connor, have you? Thank you, Dylan. <clears throat> uh, First thing I wanted to comment on was that, to a point that, that I think Steve made to Mud. When we heard about the, uh, the new charge, uh, immediately reached out to uh, some of our contacts at the FMC. And from the conversation that we had, it was pretty obvious that uh, they, they were not forewarned by the fact that this thing was coming. Uh, my bigger concern was uh, I was unfamiliar with do the terminals have to give 30 days notice to the carriers about charges? Uh, I, it appeared that they didn't. Uh, however, very definitely, the carriers have to give us notice of 30 days that they want to pass this stuff on, in my opinion. Uh, and once again, that conversation was, uh, uh, it was recognized, but certainly the answer was, uh, we're going to have to get back to you. So, uh, I mean, this thing really, absolutely came out of left field. I, I don't know what, what many of you feel, but I just, I just don't see this charge doing anything but adding more costs to the process. Uh, and at this point in time, the freight rates and everything else being what they are, the last thing I think we need is, is more cost. So maybe somebody could step in and put the brakes on this. Uh, but the, the one thing that really has struck jumped out at me in the last two days, or actually the last few weeks, trying to get to the core of what we think the problems are, particularly in LA, so we can give answers to our customers, is to say, number one, first and foremost, is the driver shortage. Uh, I mean, something needs to be done to, to enable the industry to attract more drivers and uh, uh, enable these guys to, to do more than one move a day. Is the second biggest problem, uh, piece together some statistics regarding chassis. Right now, there are 2,500 chassis close to it anyway. At one time, there was 3,000. 2,500 chassis out of service in the port of LA, Long Beach combined. There are another 1,000 chassis sitting under empties waiting to get back into the terminal. And there's another 1,000 chassis sitting under loads in the lots of warehouses because the boxes can't get stripped out. Do the math, 4,500 chassis, you know, <laughs> off the table. There, there is no way that, that you can effectively uh, handle the volume freight that we're talking about without a, a full complement of wheels. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but something needs to be done to try to get more chassis into the region. Brian Bumpus, I think your hand is next. Yeah, I think Bob touched on a really important part there of the driver shortage, uh, primarily in California. Um, California Assembly Bill AB5, which is I think still under legal review and, and, and battle, is certainly not gonna do any favors for our industry, both in terms of dre drivers, but uh, also full truckload carriers. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of interconnected issues here that are leading to, um, blockages or bottlenecks at the gate. It's not, uh, you know, based on the latest security camera uh, still shots I've seen from the, the, the entry gates of LA and Long Beach, 
there doesn't seem to be the the massive lines of trucks trying to get in that we've seen in months past. And in fact, it's quite empty because there are no chassis uh, to, to Bob and Steve's point. Um, this is not a new issue. In 2014, there was an article that came out that the Port of Los Angeles acknowledged that there was a problem with the chassis situation and pledged to, to do all they could to, to fix it and rectify it. Yeah, you know, this is obviously a couple of years after carriers got out of the chassis provision game, but nobody's really stepped up to the plate to solve that problem. I mean, shippers really can't necessarily bear the additional cost and it becomes a real estate problem for us as well. You know, where do we park all of the chassis? Um, you know, Brent Tag runs the 26th largest private fleet in America, but with our distribution centers, uh, our tank farms, our bulk loading rags, we don't have available real estate at any of our locations to stage four, five, six, seven chassis. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, the, the ugly elephant in the room is, is perhaps a lack of port efficiency. Um, you know, with the latest statistics from last year, there's not one U.S. port in the top 50 of uh, the most efficient ports in the world. Um, and that's a little bit uh, embarrassing because, you know, certainly we have access to the best technology. We have some of the hardest workers uh, in the world. We have great infrastructure here. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's some infrastructure needs that are, are to be desired, but to not have a single port in the top 50, um, I think is symptomatic of a larger larger issue, uh, especially with, um, you know, periodic labor negotiations, I think they're on every seven year cycles, pushing back on recommendations for port automation, for updated software platforms that may help the efficiency of those gate systems. You know, I don't know about the rest of you guys in the committee, but we've experienced multiple times in LA and Long Beach both, uh, where our drayage providers do have a pickup appointments um, and the, the port systems get completely overwhelmed, appointments get wiped out, and we basically have to start the process over again while also paying the demerge bill uh, for the containers that are stuck at the port. Um, an additional aspect of this that I think is leading to chassis shortages um, is, and, and maybe some of you exporters in the Midwest or who are shipping out of IPI locations um, can, can offer some clarity on this, but for our purposes, we can't get any booking con any bookings confirmed into IPI points, whether it's Chicago, Kansas City, Dallas, Memphis, um, can't get bookings there. So we've had to set up transloading networks at both coasts, which, you know, ultimately is fine. I mean, our total landed cost per pound as we calculate it really isn't that different between, uh, you know, port to port ocean freight plus the transloading costs and full truckload delivery as it would be to pay the extortionary amounts for, for an IPI booking on the rail. But what that transloading operation does, we're not the only ones doing it but it adds additional demand that otherwise would not be there for your drayage providers in, let's say, Long Beach or Los Angeles. It puts additional demand on the chassis supply, which is already tight, and it puts additional uh, demand on warehousing space and transloading staff, and certainly on full truck load, you know, 53-foot dry vans, which are already at a really disadvantageous load to truck ratio. So there's a lot of these moving parts that are all kind of interconnected, and until we kind of address you know, I wouldn't say all of them, but at least the majority of them, I don't know that we're really going to see any improvement in any single one of them. Scott Fremont, you are next on the list. Yeah, Dylan, maybe this is more of a, a question for you. Um, since the uh, committee was named, you know, earlier this year and kind of announced there hasn't been a lack of working groups, task force, and other um, groups um, focused on solving, I would say, the more immediate um, needs uh, for the, the port, specifically LA Long Beach. So, you know, I, I know a lot of these companies on the uh, call right now are involved in the White House task force, other meetings there. Is the scope of this group, just to help focus my thinking of solutions, are we focused on short term? What do we need to do in the next three months to help the supply chain? Is it long-term systemic changes, is that for us to decide? I'm just curious if we could reground ourselves in kind of the scope um, to make sure that we can have a productive conversation on where we should be focused on solving. Yeah, so real quickly, this committee is well, like long-term or more long-term in nature. Um, I think the, you know, it was established by Congress uh, earlier this year, and I think it's currently scheduled to run until 2029. Um, and the committee itself is really to advise the commission um, on its policies um, and procedures. Okay, perfect, thank you. Because I think yeah. there's a lot of really good stuff that's being talked about, but I wanna make sure we stay grounded on the longer term systemic changes as we all know there's thousands of containers waiting to get pulled out of those ports that have a lot of issue, issues um, to make sure that we're staying grounded in um, the longer term systemic changes that we need to do. So. In, 
two years from now, we're still not having this exact same conversation. Thank you. Uh, Anand Kadri. Yeah, so Scott just uh, asked this question that I was going to ask. So uh, I was trying to understand the same thing. Is like, hey, what are we looking at? Are we looking at more long-term uh, solutions? So I think that thanks for clarifying that, Dylan. So uh, keeping that in mind, uh, as I think about the longer-term components of this, uh, this, this problem, I, I do want to go back to the point that I think Scott made earlier, which is very uh, important, is that I think we need clear, measurable data across the board in the supply chain. Uh, and it needs to kind of, and, and, and whether it's kind of uh, working to identify, hey, where do we get each individual component of that data? And then we kind of link it together. But it's very difficult right now. I, I, think, I believe someone had mentioned that if we go into four different places, we can get four different milestones for the same problem, uh, for the same, uh, you know, like, hey, ha has a vessel been discharged or, or has, has a container been gated out? Uh, or is the container even available, right? Uh, or where is it in the IPI supply chain, right? IPI bottle chain. Uh, and it's very difficult to get clear, clean milestones across each of the segments so we can actually measure where some of the problem is. Uh, similarly, when we talk to uh, the terminals, we get uh, we, and we get a different metric for driver wait time. We talk to the drake carriers, we get a different metric for driver wait time in the same exact date for the same gates that we are talking about, right? So we don't actually know how long drivers wait at the gates uh, and how long they're taking to get in and out of the terminals. Uh, so that's one piece I do think that we need to kind of kind of bring us back to the topic that we were started off from is how do we get our to the point where we have clean, definable, and measurable uh, data across each segment of the supply chain, and how do we kind of push this across each port and terminal in the U.S. Right, so that we have one place where we can kind of figure out a way to get this data and information uh, when we are coming in arriving into various ports and terminals across the whole country. Right, uh, so that's one piece. The second piece that kind of uh, I, I was thinking about as I was hearing uh, some of my colleagues speak here was that um, it seems like there's an opportunity for us to do uh, uh, to whatever solutions that we are kind of putting in place to uh, make sure that they are a little bit longer term and they're not uh, particularly reactionary, right? Uh, because it takes a little while for the supply chain to adjust to some of the changes that we are making, right? So. 24 seven gates, uh, weekend shifts, uh, weekend uh, operations that uh, turn on, um, if they're sporadic in nature, uh, they're not gonna necessarily help alleviate the, the, the crunch that we are feeling right now. If we say, hey, we're gonna have uh, Saturday gates for the next six months, then the supply chains can adjust to that. The, the dray providers can adjust their, their driver force and they can figure out how to put more drivers on Saturday shifts. If you're gonna do 24 seven, operations, uh, making sure that they're over a very, uh, over a decent period of time so that the supply chains can adjust and plan against those would be another thing that I would think would, I would recommend uh, us thinking about, uh, you know, how do we kind of go drive that instead of like more, hey, there's a lot of containers in the port, let's figure out how to get them out by in the next two weeks kind of a solution, right? Because I think what we need is more sustained, defined, longer term strategies that the supply chains can adjust to. Thank you. And I want to circle back real quick to Scott's question on the purpose of the committee. I know Adnan also sort of addressed it. The function as defined by Congress, I have folks in here sitting with me and helping me out. Um, but the function as defined by Congress, the committee shall advise the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, on policies relating to competitiveness, reliability, integrity, and fairness of the international ocean freight delivery system. So with that said, Fernando Lagunel, you are next. Yes, thank you. Um, very good comments and, and, and opinions from everyone so far. Uh, again, definitely we are feeling all uh, the different issues in the supply chain. Uh, but one of the, the ones that I believe uh, we need to also look at as we look at what's happening in LA Long Beach and really looking at the root cause. Today, we see that a lot of the retailer have changed their supply chain instead of going into an IPI location, they are, uh, ending their, their international voyages in LA Long Beach. And therefore, 
there's a need to bring an empty back into the port while we have a lot of exports in the Midwest and cannot get containers and we're ready to ship, but we cannot get containers and, and the carriers are refusing to allocate containers or relocate containers into the IPI location. So uh, it seems like a solution was good, but that solution created another problem. And, and the underlying issue there is definitely the reliability of the rail and the uh, rail heads around the Midwest. So I think that there needs to be more than one act action uh, to solve a lot of the issues that, that we're confronted today. And, and I hope that working together, we can get some of those actions. Thank you. Steve Hughes. Yeah, I just want to follow up real quickly on, on what I said earlier. I know we're looking for long-term uh, solutions here, but uh, going back to the supply chain innovation, Steve, we recognized many years ago that there were that there were problems with the front gate and and managing that solution there, there nothing has happened really to to cure that it's now exacerbated by the situation we're in now so uh this is short term but it's long term they have to find a solution we have to come up with a solution for getting fluidity at the at the gate if we don't get the velocity there nothing behind the gate matters uh, one other thing, a, a comment was made about driver shortages. Right now, driver, driver shortages isn't the problem. If we get more drivers, it's just going to make a longer line. Full stop. Uh, talk to the Har uh, Harbor Tractors Association, they'll say the exact same thing. Until we get that velocity, more drivers is just going to add to the traffic jam. Uh, and then uh, the one thing that I think, uh, and this is short term, but the chassis issue, we should ask for a temporary pause on the anti-dumping duty on the chassis. Uh, until the, the domestic chassis manufacturers can get caught up, we need to get that done um, because we're just gonna be behind the eight ball until we start getting the, uh, uh, more of an inventory built up on that. I know this is short-term uh, uh, comments, but they affect us long-term. Anyway, that was it. Mike Simonanis. So again, I think to circle back on this, I think, you know, Scott's point is right that, you know, how do we make fundamental progress? I mean, we're looking at this in terms of a bunch of different teams. You know, Steve has brought up some other things that have been focused on before years ago, right? You know, this situation we find ourselves in has, is a consequence of the volume exacerbating existing problems. And yet all of those existing problems have been visible to everybody who's participating in this committee and everybody else who's not participating in this committee across many different industry organizations across the country. The question is ultimately, what can we do within the scope, both whether it's, you know, in other groups that are meeting to make progress, right? To the points raised, does extending gates, is that the root cause? I would say in a different part of the country, that was tried and, the result was no material change to the points raised by Adnan and others, right? It's one, one doing something is not addressing the root cause and doing something asynchronous to the rest of the supply chain system does not allow things to fundamentally shift, which takes time. And so I see that because of the magnitude of the problems that we're facing and the implications across from small to large firms across the country, there is a pressure to quote unquote do something as opposed to step back and pragmatic, pragmatically focus on some of these things. Again, I'm going to circle back on Port of LA and Commissioner Dye's work with the optimizer. After this many years and the and the port funding it themselves, why is it not expanded beyond the Port of LA? Why can we not get to common standards on fundamental information at the port to reduce the complexity um, that we're facing and trying to reconcile, as Dan said, between the two, three, four sources to try to guide the trucker on what's going on in this dev race too, that plans change and unwind with no, no clear guidance as to what's going on. And so we're reacting inside of reactions on top of reactions. And that's not a recipe for success for anybody who's in this committee or anybody that we're working with to get the work done on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'll take it back again to these problems and opportunities are not new. And so, 
what is necessary in the scope of this committee's work to move some of the stuff forward inside the mandate of the FMC. Because we'll, to the points kind of alluded to, we'll move past the pressure of this at some point. But what have we learned as a nation and as regions? And what are we going to be able to do with it forward to prevent this kind of outcomes from happening again at the same magnitude that they are? And that's where I, I'm not coming to the table here with an answer. I'm just saying that this is, in some senses, predictable. The more volume you put through the system, it's going to break down. We know where the where the weak points are and the points of friction. What can we do about them, knowing that, as Secretary Buttigieg has said, most of the infrastructure assets are in the private sector's hands, and which, as they should be. And so, therefore, how do we bring the parties together to start solving this beyond some of these immediate things that are unclear whether they'll yield the benefits anticipated and announced? So next on my list is Allison Wettit. Hey, uh, Dylan and everybody, thanks. Um, yeah, really, actually, uh, I think Mike just took most of the words out of my mouth on what he was just um, addressing. And I think uh, that the visibility piece is, is really one of the most essential pieces. And I think, um, as Dylan mentioned, one of the jobs here is uh, integrity and fairness. And I think integrity can, can uh, mean a lot of different things in this industry, but the integrity of the information is um, one of the most essential pieces that, that is missing. There's a lot of different breakdowns in integrity um, across the, the different areas we're going to discuss. And, and I think the next topic was fees, but the, you know, the first topic that was on the list was this, this how technology can increase fluidity and um, what we can do as a long-term approach. So I really don't have I think uh, Mike really just covered what, what I wanted to address, but I do think that visibility piece um, and how to figure out that platform and um, a go forward plan for that should be absolutely at the top of our list because that really is essential to the entire uh, ecosystem. So I just wanted to throw that back out there. Colin Yankee. I raised my hand, not know what, what Michael and Allison were going to say. Um, so it seems like we're we're getting uh, some some focus and consensus here. But every uh, call I'm on with the Port of LA, the leadership there is constantly encouraging the use of the Port Optimizer, which we use, our drain providers use, our other partners at the Port of LA use. Uh, but obviously, we know that's just for LA, not for Long Beach or other ports even outside of Southern California. And this is a, a question for the group, and maybe something we can work on as a team is. What can the FMC do or what can they recommend to Congress to do to encourage, incentivize, or even require uh, that data sharing? And so, for instance, should that data sharing uh, requirement be tied to any money that flows from the federal government to the ports? Um, or are there other means to kind of push these things that have been talked about for a long time into action? And uh, I think about you know, Steve's comments earlier on the fee that was, uh, was announced. Um, yesterday, uh, you know, that's, I understand the intent of it is to, to uh, drive behavior, right? And at what point can the FMC drive behavior to get this data sharing platform beyond just uh, kind of the Port of LA encouraging it? Because right now I, I'd push towards, I'd rather move towards a platform that is flawed and has issues that we can then work on together and uh, figure out then, um, this kind of status quo of, of only one kind of pocket of information and we're, we're uh, satisfied with, uh, with doing nothing in other places. And so there has to be some compelling factor that we push um, in order to, to get this moved along. Rich Roach. Thanks. Uh, yeah, again, we're all talking along the same lines and thinking the same lines. It's it's easy to wander uh, as we go downstream from this, but uh, you know certainly uh, one of the key provisions when in the supply chain innovation team, uh, you you can't manage what you can't measure, and so digitalization of the supply chain, getting that uh, standardization in the language is very important. Um, I know that uh, there was a comment made like, how do we get other ports uh, involved in this in other areas? Um, you know, the way that we were blessed to have Gene Soroka and the Port of LA step up with uh, funding uh, this in part. And, 
I know it's a public-private partnership, but still, how do we get more of that? I think we need to entice ports and terminal management around the country to buy into this. And maybe there's some government funding that uh, we can get in place in, in the infrastructure bill if that goes through. Uh, but I think it's very important to think uh, about that because the, the benefits that that brings in terms of uh, predictive analytics and, and when can you actually predict that your cargo will be available to come in and get it. Assuming that we get the front end gate all worked out and we can get back to normal flow, this has to be a long term uh, solution that we put into place. Uh, as far as the, uh, the hyper demerge that was announced in LA Long Beach this week, um, I, I think it will be catastrophic. I think that uh, the, the chassis are already in short supply. This will artificially suck out the rest of the containers that may be sitting in there that didn't need to be on a chassis and they're going to be parked somewhere. So we're going to probably wipe out whatever is left in terms of chassis. I think that that's something that we have to look at uh, potentially, um, as, as Bob Connor said, put the, uh, the brakes on this. And the last thing, and it may, it's like maybe a, something that we haven't really addressed so far, but as far as the IPI points, uh, places like Memphis where they have box rules in place, uh, these are, are terrible rules for our industry where chassis by one supplier may be available, but you can't use them because your carrier says you have to use a different chassis leaser. Uh, these, these things have to be addressed. Gray pool has to be looked at. And uh, it's one of the things that would ease up the flow because this is every one aspect that we have that's problematic. It impacts all of the others and we have to fix them, you know, maybe one at a time, but we really... We should focus on the most egregious, and I think uh, box rules, uh, that is that is egregious. We got to get on that, so uh, that's all. I'll leave it at there. Kaminsky. Uh, a question for, for our group. Um, do we think it would be worthwhile to actually create definitions that could be used as standard for all of the U.S.? Um, I, I, somebody had mentioned it earlier about we, we, we don't have agreements on, you know, a container discharge, you know, what does that mean? Um, do we need something as basic as, as definitions as a, as a starting platform to then start then building the technology that goes along with it to start doing our measuring? Dad, that's something we can look into on our end as well. Um, I can talk with the chair killer. Um, but anyway, I think after next is Ken O'Brien. Thanks, Don. You know, I, I actually have, uh, Rich might be looking over my shoulder because I have, uh, manage and measure written down here in my notes. I, I think, you know, Mike Simonea said it very well in saying that this is all, all of this predates COVID and that COVID was likely the spark. But, uh, you know, I, I think this industry has, has materially changed over the last decade. Um, and, and I'd say it's, you know, the decentralized supply chain on the international side. Um, Consolidation of the carriers, much bigger and much larger complex companies. Divesting of terminals to private equity. Um, the divestiture of chassis. And, you know, when you think about what typically when I speak with our members as to their struggles, one of the things that's most apparent to me is often their struggles with someone they don't have a contractual relationship with. A terminal operator, a chassis pool provider, a railroad. And so I think as, as this group talks about how we can potentially help industry change, it has to involve the actors with which we don't particularly have a relationship with. And so what I see often, and, and I think, you know, the national narrative played it out last week, right? There's a, a meeting in Washington and the president made his announcement, 24 hour gates. Port Authority leaders say 24 hour gates, instantaneously terminal heads come out in the press and say, that actually won't work. We have gates, they're, they're open already. What's the point? Um, it's, there's, no, there's, there's no one in the lines. 
It's because all the cargo is in the warehouse. Warehouse operators very quickly say, well, we can't actually bring the empties back because there's no appointments and there's no chassis. Chassis providers say, well, actually it turns out there's no chassis because they're at the warehouse and this circular firing squad um, entails. And I think to Rich's point, because we don't have the data to support, we can't find causation. And without the data to find the causation, we really can't tell what is actually broken. And so I think, as I think about this group is really a set of recommendations that ultimately become ask or potentially policy that says, what are the minimum standards of data exchange that providers of international transportation service owe to their customer? And maybe their customer is the, the steamship line, or maybe it's, the, maybe it's the, the beneficial cargo owner at the end. But I think there's, there's really something that, that needs to be done there and in defining what are those causation points and, and how do we force the people that have that data to ultimately have to put it up in front of us. And, and maybe it's just the power of groups asking, or, or, or maybe it's just the, it change, a change in regs. I don't really have a, a, a grasp on it yet, but I think this manage what you measure um, really gets back to without the data piece, we're, we're, we're really stuck. And I think that's where the FMC, you know, and the interaction with you know the STB on the rail has 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 failed us thus far, and, and certainly um, the pool providers you know seemingly operating um, in in a bit of a commercial vacuum as as do the rails that relates to the international boxes. Thanks, Bob Connor. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, when we, this is actually more a question for you, Dylan, you know, in organizing NSAC, each of the members were asked to develop a list of, of items that they thought would be viable discussion points for lack of a better term. I mean, I know that I put in six. Uh, I know that none of my six were intended to be quick fixes. It's going to take a little more thought and, you know, the rest of us to put our heads together to maybe address some of them. Is, is there any intent for, for you as, as the, uh, the foreman of the group, so to speak, to, uh, to assemble that list, share it back to us so that we can see, uh, you know, what our collective thoughts were, and maybe from that pick out a small group of items that we, we want to attack? Because, I mean, this is our first meeting together. The first reaction is to try to take big bites. And unfortunately, it, it, that's not gonna get, it, it, it's gonna be a bunch of small bites that, uh, that will get the job done. And I, I, just, I just have it in my mind that at the end of the day, we're gonna go back to uh, the commission, possibly some of the, uh, uh, the government folks that are behind you know, changing uh, shipping regulations and, and give them hardcore recommendations as to what needs to be done. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't see, uh, we need more chassis, which we do, being something to recommend to the, uh, the, you know, the, the congressman and, and, and to the commission. Maybe to put a little more control on chassis would, would be a, an item, but uh, is, is there any intent to share that, you know, amalgamate that list and share it back to the rest of us? Yeah, that's a good question. So I want to thank the committee members that have sort of sent their suggestions in. What I've been doing is compiling them, and then I will pass it on to the chair and vice chair. And now that we have those sort of established, um, I was planning on sending it to them. Um, again, part of the compilation was that, so I'm sort of like the clearing, I was sort of the initial clearinghouse of the committee. Um, so to bring those ideas, compile them, and then share them back out at least via the chair and vice chair and sort of let them make the decision on what the committee would like to do. The agency or the commission is not gonna dictate what the committee does. Um, and we wanna leave that up to you, but I sort of viewed it as an opportunity to sort of collect what the committee wanted to look at and then sort of through the chair and vice chair, let them sort of start thinking about what it might be good for the committee to um, examine. I want to also, so it's three o'clock and we have another hour. I know there's on our sort of agenda, there's items about 
cargo fees. And I know we've sort of addressed it, um, or we've they've been sort of addressing it here and there. But I know the commission is interested in hearing on if, the, if there's room for us to address fees um, and how to sort of approach various fees and how we should approach our policies towards them. Um, can, we can also continue the discussion on the supply chain or, or the visibility that's been going on. Um, Jen Morsey, I had you on my list for next. Thank you for that, um, DFO Richmond. I actually took my hand down because so many of my peers have offered the same um, opinions that I was going to bring forward. I, I just want to commend those that talked about the inland depots as being a major sore spot, um, the lack of transparency about what source of data is actually the true source of data and the actual status of, of the container. Or, or the appointment or your booking. Um, and I do think that data governance among multiple platforms is the only way forward in, in whatever form that takes. So by that, I primarily mean um, which version of the truth is the actual version of the truth that all parties involved in the movement of goods from one point to another align to use as a single point of, um, of data that is you know, agreed on and aligned on by all. And then the other the other point that I heard that I'm also 130% behind is um, hearing from the, the um, suppliers that we don't contract with that are the underlying suppliers of our carriers, right? So our carriers or our um, contractual partners are contracting or subletting out some of the services to, to the other part, parties involved and having transparency around and um, more, more connection with those parties actually holding their end of the responsibility in movement of the cargo from one point to another. Um, so, you know, I know a lot of folks have said that in one form or another, and I just wanted to reiterate for all on the call to hear that those are vital to exporters. Sean Healy. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think in terms of this committee making suggestions and advising the Federal Maritime Commission. I think it would be helpful if we understood fully what the FMC actually has authority to do in terms of making change versus maybe what they have just influence over. Um, I think that would be helpful. Further, I think uh, it would also be helpful if we understood or had an understanding of the uh, Shipping Reform Act uh, that's being proposed and how that might either increase or decrease uh, the FMC's authority on a lot of these issues that we're facing. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, just thinking out loud here, you know, if we can structure this committee in, a, in kind of an open question here, but um, if we could identify you know, six major problems, does it make sense to agree on those and have a task force of four people and, and, and divide it up, you know, into subgroups for, for each one of these issues. You know, just an open question on, on the structure of the committee. Thank you, Sean. Um, regarding the, the point on the FMC's authority, at a future meeting, we could certainly have a briefing um, by agency officials that sort of lay out uh, more clearly what the agency has authority over versus what has more influence over um, or does not have authority over. Um, I will work with, I can work with the chairs on that or with Brian and Mike on that. Uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Rodriguez. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, I just wanted to pull on that string a little bit more that, that was brought up by some of my colleagues as far as kind of uh, drilling down and getting to to a particular point of, uh, of, of an action item, so to say. Um, so, so listening to, to a lot of the comments and, and drawing a little bit on my experience, I know that one of the issues that we have 
which is really the, the, the topic here is transparency of information, right? So that data and how do we collectively gather that data, share it, analyze it, and, and ensure that uh, that it operates for us in a manner that that helps, you know, fluidity, as, as uh, Chairman Maffei said in his uh, his directives, right? Technology to, to increase fluidity. How do we how do we do that? Um, I know that there's there's programs out there. There's there's software out there that that uh, call themselves community um, community. Uh, what is it called? I just looked it up a second ago. Um, you know, community uh, transparency programs or whatever the case may be, where where some of the governments local governments may have adopted them to, to be able to, to share information as to what's going on. But, but going back to Deb's point, um, you know, I, I'd like to see that we would define, um, you know, certain terms so that they are um, universal, at least here in the US, universal amongst our different terminals, universal amongst the carriers, um, so that there's alignment in that case, um, so that we, we can harness this information possibly use some type of community system um, to make that information more visible to all the players involved. Um, and, and so again, pulling on that string, trying to draw in a focus, for me, something as simple as an accurate ETA. Um, as a customs broker, I call up uh, steamship lines all the time and ask for arrival notices, arrival information. And many times an answer may come back as, well, we're not obligated to give you this. It's a courtesy that we give you this. Well, something as simple as an ETA is a very useful piece of information in, in order to start planning and analyzing what one does, you know, through, throughout the process. Um, so if we could, perhaps a small recommendation, uh, instead of ETAs, as an example, um, being a courtesy from the carriers, perhaps it being a requirement that an accurate ETA, you know, be proposed. Um, so again, I, I just want to drill down to, to specific points. You know, we, we want to walk away from this having given um, very tangible directives to, to uh, not directives, I'm sorry, uh, tangible solutions or tangible suggestions to, to the Federal Maritime Commission. Um, and, and so that, that I think is, is, is a place to start, you know, defining exactly what we want in terms of, of defined uh, terms, you know, across the states and, and, uh, and then, you know, terminals and, and carriers and whatnot, and then drawing from there, you know, solutions that we can, that, that we can tackle. Um, this issue is huge, right? And, and it predates COVID and there's so many different issues, so many different players involved. Um, you know, so so that that a business book that came out, you know, 15, 20 years ago, how do you eat an elephant? You take one small bite at a time. Um, so I say we, we kind of focus in on, on, on specific points and, and start drawing from there. Thank you. Josh Wood. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just want to, <clears throat> first of all, uh, a little what I say will be probably reiterating what uh, Gabriel and Ken said. I, you know, I'm in, in, in significant agreement to the need for data collection. You know, as we as we think about, you know, the, the transfer of, of data, you know, predictability in and out of our ports is, is extremely important, right? I mean, there's significant dollars associated with inefficiencies throughout the supply chain. Um, you know, so to that point, to me, looking at at the 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 issues at the the let's just say West Coast ports, U.S. ports, looking at those issues kind of in, in, a, in a in a silo, um, you know, there's a reason that it's called a supply chain. So if you have multiple multiple links that are broken and trying to fix one link, I think it doesn't really solve the problem, as many of my peers have said. Um, you know, but the one thing, you know, taking it back to the, the grassroots level, you know, and thinking about, you know, from a continuous improvement point of view, like in order to optimize any business process, you got to be able to define and measure that process. And, and I don't feel like as a, I mean, you can say it as a port, as a carrier, as a country, I don't feel like we have a very good data collection plan. And I feel like in order for us to be able to, whether it's this group, whether it's the FMC, whether it's, you know, whoever, in order to go out and fix issues, we have to kind of understand what those issues are. You know, so how do we, as a as a, as an industry, how do we create things like rules of engagements with carriers to our to our ports, right? I mean, if a carrier wants to interact with us, how do we how do we create those rules of engagement so we can ensure 
the 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 right and accurate data is is being transferred back and forth um things like that like how do how do we create a data collection plan and it's kind of a, an open-ended question not necessarily directed to anybody but how do we create a data collection plan that's going to allow us to go find what the issues actually are versus you know the 50 percent emotion of what the issues are is because that's what's causing that's what's eating my lunch versus the actual issue as ken was saying these underlying suppliers and and you know all the the information that that may be invisible to a majority of the industry. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Mike Simonias. Yeah, real quick, since there was a mention on um, the intermodal environment, so I wanted to raise just one point because Rich has been very involved with the what's going on with respect to chassis in the intermodal marketplace. And so um, I want to advise everybody because it's not widely distributed information yet, but it is public and it has happened. The DCLI, uh, you know, X has been working with DCLI to try to get inside the box rule conundrum uh, for the Memphis area. And it sits inside the work we've been doing with Commissioner Dye's team for four years. But DCLI basically worked with BNSF and UP to agree for a suspension of gate control for mismatch containers with DCLI under them, right? So if it's a CMA and it should be under a track, UP, Marion, and BNSF Memphis are going to allow them in effective basically on Monday. Um, so again, not widely distributed, but this sits inside of the, you know, as we've talked about, it's not about chassis provisioning in the sense of it's, it's about the driver finding the right unit to match up, right? So unclear if this will expand beyond the Memphis Intermodal Marketplace, where we've been focused on it for four years. Un un unclear if it'll expand with the other IEPs that are serving that market or other intermodal markets, but it has happened. And it, it has happened, I think, to Bob's point on the small bite, right? This is, this is not something that was going to get solved in a 24-person meeting in front of competitors, right? It was ongoing conversations about what's feasible, what is and isn't practical, how does it happen, and working together to bring parties together. And it's not saying that it's good nor bad that AXA was involved in it. I fully support what Bob mentioned on these small bites. Coming out of this deliberation, people have different energy and different impact on what we're coming together to deal with. And so this is an example of something that it required parties to get together and talk about it. Um, and it's bringing about a small gain in a broader, set of issues inside of a system. And I'll leave it at that for now. But I wanted to make sure that people know that, you know, a lot of in the in the IEP conversations, they've kind of, you know, to the points been made, don't single out anybody. They've kind of been singled out over the course of the last four years. And in this specific case, they have moved forward to help create a, a change in what we've sought on the, on the export side for merchant haulage moves. And it's going to be an impactful change as we as we look at the complexity in the Mid-South. Rick DeMeo. Yeah, I agree with you know a lot of what's been said, and I I wanted to offer up just two perspectives. You know, as on the shipper side of this conversation, you know, I've sort of my experience has been that all fines and fees flow to us um, in some circuitous route through a carrier's hands or or somebody else to the beneficial cargo owners, and and with the idea that keeping freight moving was the spirit of these fees in the first place. Uh, we're really the only entity as a, as a BCO that, that has no control over this process. Um, not operating terminals, you know, not, not running vessels, uh, not operating trucks, don't own chassis. And I'd like to see some more accountability in our thought process um, as we, as we put these deals together. Um, you know, th there's a, there's a contract process that's uh, as you read into it and you really dig into these situations now that um, is, is sort of less than efficient and doesn't drive the right outcome. Uh, and, and I believe that there's going to be a need for a company like mine and some others to collaborate with one another and think of common ways to better use these processes and tools. So, you know, moving freight through a port has so many different entities involved, all motivated by something slightly different, 
but with this common belief that we're all here to move freight. Uh, Chris Crutchfield. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I actually took my hand down. I, uh, <clears throat> uh, Josh jumped in there ahead of me and, and uh, took the words uh, right out of my mouth on, on uh, <clears throat> uh, accuracy and, and data management. But I, I do have one other comment uh, that I would want to reiterate. Uh, something that Sean said, and and that's, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it would be a really good idea if we could identify um, a certain number, who knows, he mentioned six, or, but it could be five or seven or something other than that. Specific uh, items uh, that this uh, committee wanted to address, and uh, maybe the chair could identify those uh, along with your help, Dylan, and and the vice chair, and, and then... Um, out of everything that all of us have submitted and then uh, assign out um, some uh, smaller working groups to address each one of those. Um, uh, certainly as we operate in a virtual world, it's, it's difficult to, um, you know, really accomplish uh, uh, specific tasks and goals. Um, in, in this in, in this environment, uh, and I uh, with twenty four people, and I think if you uh, if we if we could break break that down um, with some specific one item that a uh, num uh, certain number of us are assigned to uh, address, uh, and then bring that back to the group as a whole, we might find some tangible recommendations that that uh, we could take to uh, to the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Rick, did we, were you finished speaking? You may have been accidentally muted. Yeah, I think I got muted. We apologize. That's okay. I don't know where you muted me, so I'll just leave it where it was. <laughs> Dan Miller, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I, I, like others, I pulled my hand back down. But, you know, Josh had kind of said the same thing I was going to look at as well. But, uh, you know, I think what I can add to that is, you know, if we don't have the data to, to really, you know, quantify what the issues are, then we, we see a port like we're seeing now th throwing out these uh, crazy fees. We know this is all going to come back to us. You know, I, I had a couple of calls with carriers yesterday, and they've already admitted that yes, these are going to be fees that are going to come back to us. And I, I don't think there's anybody on this call, whether it be on this committee or anybody watching, that would admit that they're using the ports to let containers sit just because that's what they want to do. Um, you know, everybody has full intentions to get these containers out, but if we physically can't get in, drivers are sitting for extra hours. There's additional costs that are already coming to us on a regular basis. This just adds fuel to the fire to all the millions of dollars that are being outlaid today for uh, detention and demerge fees or uh, driver detention sitting just because they can't get uh, you know, a single move done in a day. So, you know, I think this is something that really needs to be looked into. Brian Bumpus. Yeah, just a couple of points, um, you know, in response to, to Bob and Sean and Chris, who all kind of raised a similar issue of or, or question of, you know, prioritization of, uh, of, of talking points or agenda items. Um, you know, I would love to see the, um, the submissions of, of talking points. My gut tells me that there's going to be a lot of similarities between each respective list from the individuals. Um, you know, I think the, you know, perhaps the most effective way of moving forward into, into future meetings, which will certainly have different formats than this one, I believe, um, is to, is to organize those into, you know, like buckets basically, and then prioritize those. Um, we have to run it by a test to see if they're viable and within the FMC scope to actually do anything with. And if the answer to that is no, it kind of kills any discussion on that item. Um, but then schedule debate with the creation of agendas for subsequent meetings, um, you know, this is a kind of a, a different setting. I think we're all getting used to, obviously, you know, large virtual meetings like this in the setting. 
Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, encouraging a lot of debate back and forth, although I think today out of the gates, we all pretty much agree uh, that there's problems and we all agree on what those problems are. But, um, you know, it would be great if we could, um, again, prioritize those, those issues, schedule them on the agenda, and then have thorough debate with, with true conflict. Um, I think, you know, the best recommendations are going to come out of disagreement, as long as it's professional, um, and, and hopefully we can keep it that way. Um, on the, the topic of cargo fees, uh, I fully agree um with uh with what chris just said um and certainly with what rick was saying you know fees always come back down to the shipper you know um, stuff rolls downhill and um you know I, I have a very hard time accepting any additional cost especially for bottlenecks or inefficiencies that i have no role in in creating um it seems to 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 my or to, at least in, in my perspective carriers kind of want to have their cake and eat it too um, I don't know about the rest of you. My cargo is extraordinarily unattractive to ocean carriers. Um, it's all heavy. I move 20 foot containers and half of it's hazardous and I don't want to pay anything. So I understand that my cargo is by, by no means what they're looking for to load on ships. However, it is essential to our economic health, to food, to pharmaceuticals, to cosmetics, to national security in many cases. And we have POs that are sitting at dock in, at origin in Asia uh, since March or April of this year that still can't get a booking confirmation because the cargo is being discriminated to, to that degree. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it, it's sort of nonsensical to me to accept an additional fee while the carriers are still not doing their side of the equation per country contractual language. Uh, we have space allocations that haven't been honored. There's no reciprocity in liquidated damages. And so at least from our perspective, you know, um, we really won't accept any additional charges until there's some level of equity back, you know, placed back into the equation. I do think, Dylan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think that this falls squarely in the FMC's um, ability to broker change with this new this new fee um, in Los Angeles, Long Beach, um, you know, and certainly bringing equity back to the table in terms of how freight is is a booked and carried without discriminatory practices placed on container size or container weight or the, the nature of, you know, whether it's a has or non-has product. We will have to, <clears throat> pardon me, we will have to get back to you on the, that fee issue. Um, I have been honestly not paying attention to much anything besides this for the past few days. So I can't really comment on that, um, but good points. Um, Justin Colley, you, did you wanna raise some points or? No, oh, yeah, I just messaged you. Um, yeah, I agree with the points of the subgroup committees that we should really kind of, as they said, pick out a few of the top level points and maybe we, we submit them and we can vote on which ones we have more of a passion for. And uh, from that, we can work in smaller groups where there is that, that natural debate and that conflict where the best ideas come out. That's really kind of the, the only other thought I had is it, I agree, this large group uh, setting is just difficult to, to, to have some of those maybe uh, deeper conversations. Awesome. Deb Minsky. The only thing to add related to the the charges um, is the, the process to get them back and to be able to identify where what we're doing with the charges. Um, meaning if the port is shut out an empty return and then you can't pick up a loaded container because you can't take the empty in to reuse the chassis. There's a, a cost associated with that. And should that be on the BCO that can't pick up a container because they can't return an empty? Um, and, and how we can kind of map that out to make it more effective for something that the FMC definitely said they can support but it's hard for them to be able to support today with the current structure of how it works with empty returns and, and loads out in the supply chain. Um, so just as a thought, and you know, again, something else maybe to add to this list we're talking about, but th that's the cost, at least one part of it. Thanks, Deb. Always. All right, Ken O'Brien. Thanks, Dylan. You know, listening to a lot of the comments, as I think about the cargo fees, um, you know, I, I guess that core question is, is this group 
have the ability to, to recommend or would we recommend that you should either regulate or legislate common sense approach to cargo charges? And I think that is, there's a big question as to, you know, many of us, our views on, is that really, you know, a good thing? And I, I, I for one, am not a big fan of over-regulating anything. Um, but at the same time, I think these cargo charges, there's a, there's a core tenant in, in equity, which is, is it fair and impartial? And neutrality. And so, you know, what was done this week by the ports of LA Long Beach is effectively an indirect tax on the American consumer. I, I think quite simply, you know, should we make a recommendation or, or is there a debatable point that says that, you know, charges are, you know, be them pass through charges, cost recovery charges, are they deterrents? Are they incentives? Um, or are they just profit? And so in the case of this fee, I mean, I look quite simply, I'm in the middle of dealing, I'll use a, a one container story to tell, to tell a larger idea. I just dealt with a container that's been sitting in the port of LA for 59 days, waiting to go on a train. Should that shipper have paid for that after three days as the rule somewhat dictates it would? Um, somewhere between the terminal operator, uh, one of the two class one rails and the port rail it just didn't happen. Um, so I would argue that any charge that they created that sort of fact pattern where that shipper should ultimately pay for something like that is bad policy. And I think ultimately the regulator in charge of maritime policy should not allow things like that to happen. And so if we don't set that up, and so how do you do that? I think it's really about, again, um, this group making strong recommendations that say, you know, is there a role for the Federal Maritime Commission to weigh in on if a policy is helping or hurting? You know, I think Gabriel, you talked about, you know, arrival notices as a courtesy. Well, if we all think that those are a piece of the puzzle that help us in create cargo velocity, I'd, I'd say they shouldn't be a courtesy. They should be, a, they should be a requirement. I think certainly I see it on empty returns. Um, I would say, you know, when I fly out tonight, I have to return a rental car. Um, if they're not gonna tell me where it has to go back to, it might be pretty hard to make my flight. And so should there be a mandatory rule that says you have to tell us where the empty goes? There's a lot of hard parts that I've been on the terminal side and on the liner side, I understand the complexities of that. But if we believe at a national level that that would increase velocity and fluidity, then maybe those are the sorts of recommendations this group should make. And then the steps that have to happen to enact that can occur. But I think we have to come up with some tacit what are those roadblocks that we see? What would change them? And then how do those, those policies change as opposed to just putting layering on a fee, right? I mean, a fee is a simple solution, but it's really just a tax. It doesn't actually fix the core problem. It just creates a bucket of money. Thanks, Dylan. Thank you, Ken. And actually, I wanted to quick follow up on your remark on government and fluidity. The final item we sort of like to touch on uh, this afternoon is sort of the current state of the supply chain. I've sort of been talked about this whole time, um, but in particular, the commission is interested in hearing, as Chairman Maffei noted earlier, how government or how government agencies can help or hinder fluidity. Um, with that, Scott Fremont. Thank you. Um, I won't touch on that. And just one other quick comment um, from a, a learning standpoint. So we've talked a lot about, and I think really good points um, on what we've uh, done uh, lately um, with uh, the, uh, um, excuse me, with the um, scope of the FMC and the different things that we can um, do within our scope here. But I'm also curious, and I'll defer to uh, Brian and Mike as the chair and vice chair, if we'd be able to get you know, a pre-read next time of like what has been tried and failed in the past. Like these aren't new issues. Um, you know, I know a few years ago, there was a transportation bill, the Fast Act that had a port metric provision in it. And that was quietly killed behind the scenes. So I think it'd also be important to kind of learn and study and understand like what has been tried before and failed and maybe things are different now um, or should we be learning and adjusting from that? Um, so again, you know, Brian and Mike, your guys' call on that one, but I think that'd be good for us to know so we don't try and do something that has been tried in the past um, and has failed.
a good idea there. Uh, Rich Roche, I saw your hand up. I don't know if you still wanted to speak or. Yeah, I, I was actually still on the uh, the cost um, bullet there. Uh, just looking at, you know, the, the FMC has done some valiant work in uh, putting forward the interpretive rule last year. Um, you know, we have OSRA coming out to potentially try to codify uh, some of the aspects of the interpretive rule. I think there's a lot of frustration that uh, some of the, the points that that rule covers are being largely ignored by carriers and or terminals. Um, and there does not seem to be an adequate dispute resolution process, uh, even though uh, OSEMA had posted uh, you know, dispute resolutions, some of those links are broken. Uh, they don't point directly to uh, anything but a website uh, in some cases. Uh, and and you know, we have a gun against our head to pay these, these fees. Uh, and, and when we do get into disputes, uh, you know, another aspect of this is uh, you know, how can we make caters maybe more effective as a, a resolution um, arm of the FMC. So all of these, I, I think, are, are things that, that we need to add to our lists. Um, you know, I, OSRA may not actually come to be for another year or more. And, uh, and so we do, we do also have an ANPRM that uh, is due out from the, the FMC shortly. Um, you know, how that will address a couple of these points, uh, maybe, you know, will, will be influential in helping uh, really mold that. Uh, and I hope we are. Uh, but uh, those are, those would just be my points of uh, to finish up the, the conversation on, on fees. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sean Healy. Yeah, just a, a quick couple things. Um, you know, the, the empty return topic has come up here quite a bit um, as an issue. And we know the terminals are flooded with empty containers. Um, you know, just, just thinking as we have 12 of the largest importers and 12 largest exporters in, in the country on this committee, you know, how, how do we incentivize street turns, which would solve some of that issue about an empty return, right? And it would, it would save on drainage runs and drainage costs as well. Um, so just, just throwing that out, how do we incentivize street turns? It's something that we've tried to do many times to very, very, very degrees of success um, because sometimes the importers don't want to share the information with the exporters on what their forecast is, containers. But I, I think there's a real opportunity there if maybe this committee can identify that as, as an opportunity and a topic. Um, last thing I had, and I think maybe Stephen Hughes had brought this up about the charges being filed um, on, on such short notice. And, and I'd be curious to see what if the response is from the FMC on the 30 day filing requirements on those charges. Thank you. Thank you. Adnan Kudri. Yeah, just a couple of quick points. Uh, so, one, maybe just a suggestion for Michael and Brian as you're kind of looking at the list of uh, all of the the, the core issues that the teams have provided uh, that uh, uh, overall, it might be a good one to maybe just kind of, as you consolidate them and kind of bucketize them, it might be a good one to maybe put those out to vote with the committee to see which ones, you know, kind of uh, that most are kind of interested in kind of following up and supporting uh, and then maybe using that as a way to uh, kind of balancing that against uh, the FMC charter to kind of identify the four or five critical issues that we're going to go after. And then we can potentially build, you know, five, six member subcommittees to kind of start working behind the scene on those. I think that might be a useful uh, piece to kind of look at as a recommendation on how to kind of move forward. Um, and I also wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the, the second topic that we were talking about, the detention and demerge component of it. And I think Ken touched on this a little bit. Uh, like. It, in the past, like the, the whole idea behind detention and demerge pieces was how do you incentivize faster turns into uh, returning equipment and bringing fluidity into the network and the supply chain, right? Uh, in, in, the, in its current state and the way current, the supply chains are moving right now, um, I, I don't think that DND is actually incentivizing anything. Uh, it's not, I don't, I don't think that there's a way for it to incentivize uh, particularly, you know, uh, like folks are not sitting on 
container returns uh, because they want to, right? Or they don't, they're primarily sitting on it because they don't have a way to kind of get those containers returned uh, and those empties returned uh, and get that volume and fluidity back into the cycle. And it's very difficult to wrap our heads around this idea of uh, these these detention and demerit charges, which are not necessarily kind of making the process any better, and uh, and they're actually not driving any kind of uh, positive behavior in the, currently in the way the supply chain is currently set up, uh, and and that concerns me a little bit. So if you were saying that hey, we're going to take this, um, you know, we're going to take these charges and we're going to use these to make the overall supply chain better, right? And we're going to take this, and I think the the BCOs might. And and the, generally, the shippers will feel a little bit better. Transparency around these charges and how and where they're actually uh, driving uh, in terms of uh, you know supply chain benefits. Uh, I don't uh, in its current state. That's what concerns me the most is that we are uh, most of these uh, charges don't necessarily help us improve our supply chains in the long run. Uh, and I don't think they're actually driving any benefit to the current state that we are in. So just a thought on that. Thanks, Adnan. Josh Woods? Yeah, I, I want to touch on, I'll briefly touch on detention and demerge. Um, I don't want to repeat what a lot of a lot of my peers have said. You know, but the one thing about, about detention and demerge is Again, the the lack of, of of data. So right now, the burden of proof really stands on the on the shoulders of the BCO to prove whether it's accurate or not, right? And 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 one thing that we can't undersell, I think, is the the magnitude of what we're talking about, right? It's hard to think about. It's just randomly fifty four hundred containers on the ocean of those or container ships of those container ships. How many containers are on those ships, right? The actual tracking and tracing of those containers is 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 significant, you know. And and so, again, the uh, we as a, as a I think as a as a committee and a council, we we have to be able to quantify how big of a how big of a for lack of a better term, a journey it is to even get to the level of detail that we should be requiring in order for shippers, or sorry, in order for for um, vessel operators to charge us these these fees, you know, and and you know, I, I truly believe that if 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 the data says that those fees are are accurate and true, yeah, you should pay them. Right? As far as regulating that, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily have an opinion about that. But I think that in order for us to be able to, to say that we should or shouldn't be paying these penalties or these fees, we have to have the data behind it and we just don't. So right now, what that really boils down to is not only, you know, shippers like everybody on this council, but shippers across the country are now being forced to try to, to prove that they they do or don't owe or they don't owe these these penalties. You know, so I'll I'll pause on that because that really circles back to what I was saying about having a data collection plan and, and really forcing rules of engagement from a data perspective um, with our with our with our international sea freight partners. But what I really wanted to touch on is, you know, what do I think, you know, the, you know, whether it's government or, you know, any kind of agency um, helps or hinders these processes is, you know, and I, and I think and we touched on it earlier in, the, in this meeting, and, it, and that is the cross functional engagement. Um, you know, this, this, I think kudos to the FMC, right? I mean, this is the first step, but think about all of the other, all of the other agencies out there, like DOT, um, you know, if you think about at the, at the more private level, you think about like the truckers association, you know, so a lot of the cross-functional engagement, again, is going to be required, I feel like, and is needed in order to help this situation along, um, simply because this isn't only a, Federal Maritime Commission problem, right? I think this is a DOT, this is a FMC, this is a USDA, this is a this is a a problem that has the magnitude beyond anything I don't believe any of us have ever seen, and it's going to take that type of engagement in order to help move progress along. Um, and and so and I know that's a little bit high level and vague, 
but you know if you if you ask me from from my perspective what i think the you know the government and agencies are doing to hinder and help to hinder is i think there's a little little less cross functional engagement than it probably should be and then to help i think there needs to be more cross functional engagement because that's ultimately how we're going to you know start plugging the holes in the dam Thank you, Josh. Um, Gabriel Rodriguez, I will get to you in a second. I want to note that we are sort of getting towards the end of our discussion time. Um, so after Gabriel goes, I'll see if uh, Mike or Brian have any comments they would like to make, and then we'll sort of go from there. All right, Gabriel Rodriguez. My comments re regarding demerge and detention kind of flow a little bit from from what Josh just said. Um, you know, as a day to day practitioner, being a customs broker, I pay the actual demerge and detention directly to the lines and the carriers and argue the point and uh, and look at that data on a day to day basis. And you know, just just as a small piece of of uh, of, of like of data to see where we were to where we are, we did a quick analysis here. Uh, August 15th to September 15th last year over this year, it was a 15 fold increase uh, from, from last year to this year in the amount of demerge that we paid on behalf of our customers. And as a small company, I pride myself on making sure our customers don't pay demerge. But as we analyze the situation, I, I go back to, to, to a quick comment that Brian made, you know, you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And that's exactly what's going on right now is Unfortunately, we're, we're, we're paying a lot of demerge and detention for circumstances we have absolutely no control over. Uh, and, and the carriers, terminals, and, and other parties are, are, are basically, you know, forcing you to play by the rules, but not playing by the rules themselves in the sense of, you know, if you've got four days of, of free time at a particular port or, or terminal, you know, then, then make the container available and make it accessible within those four days. Don't start charging me free time you know, with the container not really being available and then me have to chase you down to update the free days uh, and, and go through that process. And I think a lot of that happens within within what's going on right now, similar to, to you know, per diem charges. You, you can't return a container. Four months down the line, you get an invoice for not having returned that container. Then you got to go back to the carrier and prove to them that you tried to return the container. So so there's a lot of circumstances like that that, that, that you know, occur in the day-to-day -day activity that I think if we if we were able to to make some recommendations to allow there to be some sort of, of manner in which either the carriers and terminals start playing by the rules um, or you know something like what I did here I called up my local FMC office and I said you know hey there's a theft and they said yeah we're not the cops and I said well you guys got to operate in some way shape or form to help me out here because what's going on is is akin to a theft, right? You know, we're paying for stuff that we have absolutely no control over. Um, so, so as we as we develop these conversations, I think that that statement of having your cake and eating it too um, is something that we need to dive into and see how we can, you know, maybe change a little bit of of uh, how those rules are played by. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. You on you since you're the chair here. No, just uh, I wanted to thank everybody for, for their comments. Um, I've got some copious notes here, both on what we talked about today, but also on some requests that each of you have made for kind of the future meetings. Um, and I really appreciate the, the, the input and the leadership that all of you showed today. Um, you know, certainly, um, uh, Dylan, I don't know that I have contact information for everybody on the committee, but if I if you could make that available to me, um, I'd like to reach out to each one of them individually and just share my contact information as well. Um, I believe in open door policy, so if there's anything that I can do, uh, anything that you guys have uh, re requested for agendas, um, I'm sure Michael keep an open door as well. But um, you know, I really appreciate your involvement and um, and your support. Thank you, Mike. Do you have to... Yeah, I got just echoing what Brian said. We're not the gatekeepers of. Uh priority here, right? This is 24 people working together. We're going to try to make sure we work together closely. And so I think, you know, I, like he, want to have transparency. So I, to, to Bob's point, everything that's been suggested, I think we float it to everybody and look for commonality, consensus, and where there's traction. I, you know, the, the suggestions by Sean and others on the working groups make sense to, because some things may not be as pressing for you, but yet it's important that you're engaged on the things that are engaged for you and your organization and your industry vertical. 
my ask would be a couple of things. What do we want from a meeting frequency standpoint? Ultimately, how do we, you know, get some of these other things in place? And, you know, what Scott said, you know, um, what's already been looked at, reviewed, so we don't go down a long path and there's been a bunch of work done on it already. Um, and really more get inside of what, maybe why it wasn't feasible at the time it was suggested, right? Or what's kept it from getting forward. So I think to be more informed as we look at the universe of things we're focusing on, I think is, is important. So look forward to working with everybody. Agree with Brian, let's get your private contact information so we can engage in a more dynamic way as we move forward out of this and, and ready, to, ready to roll in the areas that make sense for all of us. Thank you guys. <clears throat> Uh, regarding the meeting frequency, the only mandate that's in the charter is that the full committee meet once, at least once a year. I think we sort of assume that the meetings may be more frequent than that, um, but I was going to leave that up to you all um, as to the frequency um, to the meeting schedule. Um, we also have, the committee has the use of Zoom uh, to use for its meetings. Um, there, I imagine, will be an opportunity for in-person meetings um, in the not too distant future, but I'm not gonna promise anything on that right now. Um, the next agenda item I have is a summary of written comments. Because this is this committee is an advisory committee subject to Federal Advisory Committee Act rules, there is always an opportunity for the public to comment um, and to submit written comments to the committee. Um, if we are doing it in person, there sometimes are opportunities for the public to present directly to the committee at their meetings. We are not doing that today uh, because of the nature of Zoom. Um, but I will report that the committee received no comments so far. Um, and as they do, I will sort of share it with the chair and vice chair and sort of distribute it through them. Um, with that being said, I believe sort of concludes the meeting. I want to thank the committee members for attending today. Um, I hope you all found the discussions fruitful. Um, I want to thank all the participants who logged on to view. Um, I hope you also thought that was an engaging session. And I want to thank, of course, the chairman and commissioners uh, for helping set this up. Um, and so with that, I believe that concludes the first meeting. So thank you all for attending and I will be in touch with the committee soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. See you next time. Thank you. I think I can end the meeting. I'm just kind of moving off. Yeah. I just found it disorienting.